in accordance with the open meeting law, the board states for the record that this meeting is being recorded by NORCAM and may be recorded by other local media. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Anyone here for public comment? We're going to uh, change up the agenda a little bit out of cycle. If we're going to be added something, we're going to have Mrs. Magna come up now. Mm -hmm. If Mrs. Magna wouldn't mind coming to the podium and just uh, state your name for the folks listening at home. Hi, Sue Magna, Veterans Director for the Town of North Reading. I'm here tonight, and I asked um, some of the veterans and as well as the spouses of veterans to join me tonight because we have some pretty exciting news. I've been trying for some years um, to get the wall that heals to come to the town of North Reading. So this past year I applied again. We had 100, they had 117 applications. Out of 117 applications, 34 were accepted. Uh, two for Massachusetts, one being Bellingham and the Ooh. other one, the town of North Reading. Woohoo! <laughs> So I know you have a lot in your agenda, so I, and I apologize, I literally put this together real quick um, tonight, because I've been out of, out of the office. So what I have is um, the wall of heels, and this is what we're getting. This is the, how it'll come in, the mobile unit. This is um, how it looks at night, illuminated. In the daytime, this is the largest moving wall out to date. This wall is 375 feet long. We will be hosting it at the Ipswich River Park. Um, and I will be coordinating this with Maureen as well as uh, Martin, Marty Tilton. It has, this one also comes with a mobile unit. Um, an understand an education center, if you will, for the kids. So this adds more than the, there's a couple of walls out there, so let's, I just want to clarify, there's the wall that heals, which is this one, and then there's the moving wall. The moving wall does not come with the mobile center. Um, where this one does come with the educational moving center, um, and it also will host our hometown heroes illuminated up on the wall there. Uh, this is the mobile unit, as you can see, um, how it'll look, stance expanded out. And the wall will be coming to the North Reading um, Itchwood River Park. And I apologize, that date, the 19th is wrong. It's the 15th to the 18th. They'll be in here on the 14th, which is a Wednesday, um, to start setting up. And uh, Wednesday, uh, Wednesday the 15th, excuse me, Wednesday the 15th, they'll be coming in, right? Uh, uh, 14th. Yeah. 14th is, is the Wednesday. 14th, they'll come in to set it up. Thir and then we'll do a, a, what they call a soft opening that evening. Right. Thursday, Friday, um, and then Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and Sunday, we'll, we'll have it. Yeah, like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Tuesday, and then the 18th is uh, Sunday, which in, late in the afternoon, we'll stop breaking it down again. They'll be out of here on the 19th. Um, this is a tremendous, a tremendous feat for the, for the town, as far as I'm concerned, a, 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 an amazing, um, for, the, for the Vietnam veterans, their spouses, we've lost, Five Vietnam veterans, I want to say, in the past eight months here alone. Um, and I can't be more proud to bring this here to our Vietnam veterans and to the community in general um, to and be able to be honored to, for us to host this. Um, it will require about 150 volunteers in total. Um, and we will require about 30, 30 volunteers to set up and about 30 volunteers to break down and then it has to be ship, um, has to be around the clock shifts from there um, to maintain and have somebody on board all the time. Not for worrying about anybody in, dis in the destruction end, but more, it, there are gonna be people, believe it or not, they'll come out at two, three in the morning 
when it's very quiet and everything to uh, come in and look it up. So it'll give you the option to um, rub the, their, the names of the people that they know. This will come completely illuminated. There is nothing we have to do with the wall itself other than have it manned. Um, and if we're looking to have any kind of um, souvenirs for that event, for the event, which I will work on that as well. And, uh, but this is a tremendous opportunity for us and um, I'm looking forward to it. So surprise to my veterans over there. I hope you all, I know we've all been working hard to try to get this. It's been like eight years in the making, so we finally did it. That's great, that's great. congratulations. <laughs> Susan, could I ask you a favor if you could get on the school committee's agenda to present this to them because I think it'd be great. I know the kids would be out of school, mm -hmm. but you know the kids have to do hours, community hours, and I think if you can get more high school students to participate in this so they can actually learn, they don't have the real true appreciation for what this all means. So if we can get a lot of school participation, I know they're out, but the community hours still can be collected. If we can, Maureen, work with them to make it a community service hour for Absolutely. them. Absolutely. I think that would be fantastic to see them there managing, working yeah, the wall. Sign up genius. Yeah. Sign up genius uh, uh, ongoing for <coughs> positions in different hours, what ones the high school volunteers can do, what the ones the, the actual yeah. veterans can do. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. And, um, do a lot of marketing on it. My goal ha was to have this actually brought here during school, school time. Um, and because of the weather in New England, they kind of shy away from the October end, so they're usually more yeah. down the south. That's okay. And I did push, I did everything I could to try to get it. Those are still very good. Any I dates are good. It's going to be an amazing, amazing educational piece. And absolutely, the schools will be notified, and I would love to get it to the one okay. of the committee. Thank you. I want to thank your veterans, your veterans committee. Thank you for, for bringing this to our town. This is a wonderful uh, tribute to have here in town. We're honored to have it, so thank you. Okay. Thank Board you, members, folks. any questions? Are you, we're good? Okay. That brings us to the uh, board member reports, and uh, we'll start with Mrs. Mignapelli tonight. Mr. Schultz. Yeah, uh, just a couple of things. There's been a lot of uh, comment on social media regarding the proposed 40B development at 20 Elm Street, which is down by Teresa's near Thompson Country Club. Um, and I know a lot of times the residents feel in the dark on these things, and they feel like these developments are dropped in on them so I want to have full disclosure and let everybody know what I know as far as this proposal right now um, we had a meeting with myself mr. Prisco miss McKnight mr. Gilberto with the developer I believe it was back in June and the developer said he wanted our input and wanted to get back to us on the subject um, we saw his initial plans we thought it was a bit much for that small area it didn't quite fit our vision for that area of town um, gave him our personal opinions, certainly explained that we're just one of five. Um, never heard back from the developer. The town planner reached out recently, no reply, and <coughs> contrary to the developer's assertion that he wanted the town's input and feedback, the first I heard about it was a letter from Mass Housing, um, and now they want to put 200 rental units in there. Uh, there is a walkthrough tomorrow at the property, which is right next to Teresa's Prime, at 10.15 a.m. Uh, the town has taken the liberty of advising the abutters so they would know so again we want full disclosure on this if you can come out you want to see the property I'd recommend you do that that's at 10 15 tomorrow and it's 20 Elm Street thank you anything else mr. mr. Masseri you have anything uh, we did have a water meeting last week do we have a water meeting and we have one scheduled for Tuesday night I think it did. any update and, on uh, that okay, I'm sorry getting closer to identifying and acquire the land required for the chlorine pumping station on Main Street. So that's progressing in a positive direction. That's progressing in a very positive direction. Awesome. And, and our approach to the two stations, try to make them identical, one for on our property on Central Street mm -hmm. and the one on Main Street. And this is to add chlorine to the uh, water supply coming from Andover so that it guarantees there'll be adequate chlorine content at the other end of town, the far end of town. Great. So uh, 
nailing yep. down the uh, property will allow us to go forward with the FEIR, the final environmental impact report mm -hmm. that needs to be filed to move the project forward. That's great. And I know it's on the agenda tonight, so. Yeah, you'll get more, we'll more get details to be detail offered time. with uh, consultant Roberts here, Mark. Uh, so we'll be offering a more detailed uh, update great. later on. Thank you, Steve. Anything else, Mr. Masseri? No. Mr. O'Leary? Um, I, I know it's early. Instead of all the new business, I just figured while well, people are still awake, you know, just uh, wishing everybody a happy and safe holiday season and uh, a healthy and prosperous new year. And um, to. Uh, Mrs. Magner, I'm sorry she left, but again, offer our condolences on the passing of her oh, father. Yeah, we should. Uh, just this past week, and I know it's a terrible loss for her family, and uh, offer our condolences to her. Yes. Okay. That's it. Yes, I wish we had <coughs> grabbed her while we were here. So, uh, I agree. Anything else, Mr. O'Leary? Uh, just in relation to uh, the, the 40B proposal, you know, I think it's important that. Uh, the, the people understand that uh, it's not even a Christmas jingle. <laughs> Marcy, can you please? <laughs> She's the only one here that knows technology. <laughs> no, just in relation to the 40B project that's, uh, that's being proposed, I think it's important for the public to understand that um, the owner of the property, the developer, certainly has the rights uh, under state law to, to propose uh, this type of a project. And I think it's important for uh, us as uh, board members and uh, uh, town as an administration to better understand and appreciate the process that they have to go through and the process that we have to go through in order to uh, consider the project as what's going to be proposed. Uh, we've had a, a long-standing uh, processes here in North uh, Threading that has worked very well over the years. Uh, and uh, I think it's important that uh, elected members and uh, appointed members and members of the administration be cautious in their uh, public comments uh, to ensure that we don't uh, put the town at a disadvantage in considering the proposal, to put the town at a disadvantage in relation to uh, what the specifics of the project may end up being and looking like, and that uh, we should make sure that the process uh, is allowed to run its course appropriately and not necessarily in, unnecessarily incite uh, public concern unnecessarily. You know, as the process unfolds, there'll be plenty of opportunities for input. And I think the process that we have here, which has been modeled, used as a model for the state to uh, encourage other communities to do the way that we've handled it in the past, uh, should be allowed to run its course. So as far as comments on social media, as far as uh, even public comments in relation to what our feelings may be, uh, we should allow uh, the process to unfold in an orderly fashion uh, in order to ensure the town's best interest is maintained and the town's say as to how the final product comes out. Otherwise, we're jeopardizing the town's position. So, yes, uh, the walk, walk through on the property is tomorrow. I would encourage people who are interested to be there. Uh, but that's just the first step. There's going to be lots of uh, opportunities for input. So I, I don't want to get into a long discussion on this, and I'm not going to have anybody uh, commenting on it, but I will say this, Mr. O'Leary, because I do believe you're trying to single out a few of us. And I can understand that, but I want to make sure you fully understand the situation here. We're going back to sometime, Mrs. McKnight, back in the summer. <coughs> June. Uh, Mayor June. Mayor June. I get a phone call within day or so I come down here we have a meeting very informal I mean back of an envelope type discussion here I know the process Mr. O'Leary you've been here for a long time your brother has participated in this process and probably has been the architect for how this process should work and, and I agree with it I think it's a fantastic process this town has put in place so we had an agreement that we would follow this process we talked about it we didn't, I didn't hear anything until all of a sudden I get something in, mailed to me that this thing is happening. So we want to follow the process, but what you have here is a developer that doesn't want to follow that process. So I think you're singling out the wrong individual. Um, and I think what you need to do is be cautious when you have someone that wants to 
take this and jam it down the town's throat without having conversation and letting us be part of the solution, be part of the conversation, that concerns me. That, that's troubling to me. I've been here long enough to know when something isn't right and this isn't right. And to be singling us out because we've been caught off guard on this, I, I think it's wrong and I think we're off to a very bad start. Because you're right, Mr. O'Leary, there is a process. And I hope we can get back to that process because I think it's a very good process. I think the CPC understands it well. I certainly understand it well. The problem is the person that submitted this document doesn't understand it. So, I think what you'll find, Mr. Chairman, is that if you look back historically as to what's occurred, and Mr. Pierce can attest to this because he was involved in all these subcommittees, and most of the subcommittees that, uh, that I chaired for years and uh, for hundreds and hundreds of hours, and invested uh, the time to, to make sure that the process was working. For the most part, we didn't find out about any of these things until we got notified by the state. They didn't come up. So, I mean, the first, and again, I, I'm not here to defend or anything. All I know is discussions took place in June. The board members weren't even aware of it, or the rest of us were not aware of it, that it was even a proposal I wasn't until aware about five weeks ago when, when passing a comment was made, and then we got the notice, what? three weeks ago. So the fact that they came forward to alert us was actually a step that we were not used to, or generally are not used to and not afforded uh, in the past. So uh, I think, again, my words of caution, I would hope that you, you would take them uh, for what you think they're worth. I mean, it's, uh, um, we, have, we have at least 10 of these things under our belt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and it's worked very well. And well, I think we'll what's see. getting off to the wrong start is getting social media involved and making statements up front when it has when they we haven't we just got notified. Formally well, just got notified. Again. Formal there were, notification. There was an agreement. There was a well, again, process it, that uh, was dictated. Agreement, agreement between whom? Not this board wasn't even informed. The C P C wasn't informed. I mean, an application I wasn't even made. I, I'm not gonna get into the debate. The process has started. We're gonna let the process flow, flush itself out. We're not going to get into a debate tonight. No, no. But Again, the bottom line is, caution. I'm, I'm not taking. I, I don't need caution. you to caution me. Uh, no, I'm no, not cautious. Is, I, I don't I'm, need I'm, you to caution me. So no, actually, you, actually, I believe you do. No, I don't, sir. You have because a lot of hubris. Right now. We're no, moving no, no, on. No, you're out of order. You don't on. have any idea. You're out of order. We're moving on. So I have one thing tonight that I wanted to bring up under the board report, and our Northeastern Massachusetts Law Enforcement Council each year honors a citizen for their outstanding service and support to the NEMLIC and its mission. This year, they selected Lieutenant Thomas Romeo. He was awarded the uh, Philip L. Mahoney Exceptional Service Award. So I wanted to just take a moment tonight to recognize Lieutenant Romeo, congratulate him on receiving the distinguished, distinguished honor of the Exceptional Service Award. So uh, the town administrator, if you could just pass along my sincere Congratulations to him, and I'm sure the other board members as well. I think that's an outstanding, it's, uh, it's certainly something that um, he's earned. He certainly deserves it. Uh, Tom is a consistent contributor to the NEMLIC, and it's an important part of our safety in our community, so I want to thank him. Okay, so that's it. Uh, next thing on the agenda of the minutes. Mr. O'Leary, the November, to, oh, actually, you know what? We can come back to the minutes if you board members don't mind. We have the CPC here tonight. I'd like to move, move right to the, uh, meet with the CPC. We're going to go over the joint appointments for Economic Development Committee, discuss the RFP associated with the senior housing, I, which I asked to be on there, and we'll, we'll go over that. We'd love you to participate in that conversation. So we'll start with the joint appointments, and I'll hopefully get this to work right. Okay. Mr. O'Leary. Let's see what we have here. It's just Chris. Yeah. Just oh, I got it here now. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I move to reappoint Chris Hayden as associate member to the Economic Development Committee for a term to expire July 12th, 2021. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. We, it's a roll call vote, so we'll start with the CPC, unless you have some comments you want to make for us. Uh, no, we, uh, we do appreciate Chris putting the time into this and uh, helping us 
uh, stay abreast of what's going on with that commission and uh, we contribute to as much as we can as well. So, uh, as for me, I say aye. 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 And the Board of Selectmen, Mr. O'Leary? Aye. Mr. Masseri? Aye. Mr. Schultz? Aye. Mr. Minupelli and the Chair votes aye. Thank you, Chris. The Economic Development Committee is very active. I appreciate you being part of it. Uh, I think they have a lot of work ahead of them, especially uh, as we hopefully someday get into the wastewater, more active in the wastewater. Yeah. There's a lo lot to come. So tonight, I asked for us to discuss the RFP associated with our senior housing. It's been a discussion I've heard since even before I was on this board. And I think, um, you know, with the, the holiday season upon us and with us getting into the new year, we just finished our strategic planning update, which we've presented, and it's in our strategic plan as one of our objectives. Um, you know, and I've said this before, the town is land rich, cash poor. You know, anybody, if you haven't been over to see PBD Court, I really encourage the community to see it. You know, last year I had two members of um, Secretary Ash's office come out and do a walkthrough of the property with us in detail. We went underneath them. People don't know that there are crawl spaces underneath those buildings. Um, the building's tired. Our senior housing is tired. And I think the time is now to address it or have a plan. Let's, and if we have all this land, we have this land available to us. Why can't we come up with a solution? My discussion, what I'd like to have tonight with the board, and we've discussed it during our exam, our strategic planning session is, why can't we have an RFP to put this land out there, even if it's for a dollar, to a developer, to develop and build us senior housing at some level for, if it's affordable for a North Reading residents and then the rest <coughs> commercial rates. If it gets us there, why can't we consider that? Is that a doable thing? Is that even legal? And that's why I was hoping we could have a brief discussion tonight with the board, with the CPC, and members of the community, if you would like, to participate in this conversation. But can we at least try to pick a starting point for this evening? And I'm not sure, Town Administrator, you want to maybe start things off. Sure. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, and to the members of the board, if you have your packet in front of you, we're on page 41, which is a memorandum from the town planner, which I believe the Planning Commission has also been provided a copy of. Uh, so I've spoken with the planner um, to convey uh, some of the desired um, well, the, the overall des desire of trying to increase our available uh, housing for seniors and the uh, initial discussion that's taken place at the strategic planning level regarding the par property at the end of Carpenter Drive. Uh, there's also an abutting property on uh, Parsonage Lane. And um, she has had some conversation with the housing services office uh, relative to what might or might not be feasible for uh, development there. Um, which uh, I'm going to ask her to just kind of summarize for us here, but I, I want to make it very clear. I don't want anyone to think that that has presupposed any sort of a decision with regard to the direction we're going to go in. Um, it's more just the research that we've been doing to try to inform our discussions here. So I need to make that very clear as we're, we're going through this. And through you, Mr. Chairman, I'll ask Ms. McKnight to just summarize. If we could give her the microphone, Mr. Pierce. <coughs> If you would like, I do have a okay. slide that just um, shows the properties. Oh, thank you. Oh. Again, you're going to be discussion, discussing a couple parcels, and one of them was identified for a some type of senior housing at some point back many years ago, right? Mm -hmm. I think it was identified. Ten acres? Yeah. <coughs> If I may briefly, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Yeah, we've actually we've looked at this property for a while, and we thought this would be a good use for it. And um, and we also looked at some of the ways that it could be done um, <clears throat> to make it um, not just good for senior housing, but also to make to provide some services involved in the in the development of it to help the people that would live there uh, get access to maybe a small store or something like that. So. Um, this is something we've been looking at, something we've been uh, talking about for a while, so we uh, really appreciate it being brought forth now. I think it's a good thing for the town. <coughs> Mrs. McKnight. There are two properties highlighted here. Um, the first is uh, Carpenter Drive, which is a 10-acre property that the town owns, and the other is uh, Parsonage, 12 Parsonage Lane, which is a five-acre parcel. 
Um, <coughs> excuse me. Free Carpenter Drive was the subject of um, a proposal done about a decade ago, initiated by the Housing Authority for um, supportive housing. Um, at the time, there was a state grant available. Um, the Housing Authority got permission from town meeting, um, because it is a town-owned property um, rather than a Housing Authority-owned property. The Housing Authority received permission from town meeting to pursue this project in partnership with a nonprofit to uh, use state grant money to build uh, supportive services uh, housing. Um, and that would be housing that's not um, just traditional affordable housing, but that had significant services for seniors, uh, medical related and so forth, excuse me. The grant was not successful and that grant is no longer available. Um, so over the years, this was a property that was highlighted in our housing production plan as having been previously identified as um, appropriate for senior housing. Um, <clears throat> now, what we have been talking about more recently is more traditional affordable housing, which does not include supportive services necessarily. But one of the questions I did want to ask, because that this was something that was pursued in the past, it had been talked about in the past, if that was the direction that the town wanted to take with this property, there are other resources, they're different resources, but there are other resources that would be available to the town for that type of project. That would be more in the form of long-term loans um, at low interests with uh, opportunities for deferred payment, but they wouldn't be grant funds. Um, so that would, would be one type of path we could go with this. Another type of path that we could go with it would be uh, the discussion, um, uh, you know, as, as the town administrator referred to, the discussion that we've had with the Regional Housing Services Office, and they, they would help us with either path, but what we've talked about most recently with them is um, putting out an RFP to develop this in a more traditional affordable housing type um, project. Um, so I, I was interested in your feedback on whether we do want to pursue that more traditional type of affordable housing rather than, you know, introduce a component of, you know, whether it was medical services or other supportive services. Um, and also, roughly what size project we're thinking of. Um, about 10 years ago, this was looked at as about a 24 unit project. Um, we can stay with that, we could increase it. it um, these are so just some points that our uh, consultant with the Housing Services Office has asked me, roughly what, what, what's the scope of this you know, thing that you're looking at, and also whether we wanna consider um, having any market rate units mixed in, because if we were to do 100% affordable housing, there would need to be a subsidy that came from the town. Um, there are opportunities for state grant funds for very low income rental only projects. They do have waiting lists. They tend not to favor senior housing, they tend to fam favor family housing. Though um, it is possible that we could compete for a grant like that to get money um, toward a senior only affordable housing project. Or if we, um, if we were to mix in some affordable units, uh, that would really carry the deficit um, because each of the affordable units is constructed at a loss. So, um, you know, at, at one point when we had talked about doing this project, we had talked about doing 100% affordable, and it, in, in that way, we would need to have a significant subsidy from the town in order to help a developer make up the difference. Um, these were kind of the basic questions I, I was looking for feedback from um, before we continue our conversations with the Housing Services Office. They're happy to offer their support, any of the paths we choose, um, what it, whether it's RFP development or pursuing state programs um, for subsidies, but uh, that's what I wanted to request feedback on. Mr. Goldberg. Uh, just a clarifying question through you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the 24 unit project that you referred to that was being looked at a number of years ago, was that limited to the property on Carpenter Drive at that point in time? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Mansari, then Mr. Schultz. Can you explain why you picked these two lots of land? Thank you. The reason was um, <clears throat> when we were doing the housing production plan, and even before that, um, we had heard a lot of conversation about how there was a desire to look for an, an opportunity for senior affordable housing on the Carpenter Drive site. Um, at the time, there seemed to be some support and consensus for going ahead with, um, you know, a, a, a grant-supported project. I think that the town, you know, authorized the Housing Authority to go ahead um, three years in a row in order to try to pursue this grant. Unfortunately, they weren't successful. Um, but this property has always sort of been flagged. <laughs> so to speak, as a, as a possible area for senior affordable housing. Um, I don't really know the history of Parsonage Lane, only that it abuts the property, that the town owns it, um, that if we wanted to pursue it, 
Mr. Schultz, and then I'm going to um, turn Virginia over to Warren, I don't know who would be best answers. What is the topography of that area? Is it pretty, in, is, can you get to one property from the other? Is it hilly or? Mr. Yeah. Ed. Yeah. Uh, 12 Parsonage is, a, is hilly. Okay. Uh, three Carpenter is flat. Okay. But uh, why I was asking for recognition earlier, 20 years plus ago, I was on a reuse committee for the uh, Weeks building, which is now the David Damon Tavern. It was oh, okay. always the David Damon Tavern, but it had been the old library uh, to, to see if we we're going to save that building or sell it or whatever was going to happen to it. Uh, parcel of land over at Ipswich River Park, um, the old farm. Wheeler. Wheeler. Wheeler the, the Wheeler property to see if we should buy it or um, <coughs> let them you know, dispose of it anyway. Uh, if it was uh, used for the town and 12 Parsonage Lane. Um, and the other property, which is now Three Carpenter, was something else at that point in time because there was no street there. And one of the, what came up Two things we already know of, of the three was the old Weeks Library, which has been restored as the, the Damon Tavern, and the Wheeler property, which is now incorporated basically into Ipswich River Park. The third part was, was 12 Parsonage, and if you've ever been out there, it's a beautiful piece of property. Um, can you get from one to the other? You can get from one okay. to the other. You can get from one to the other. And with yeah. the development yeah. that's happening up in Mount Vernon, I think it might be a good thing to try to save that parcel because they've got a 40B there already, just up the way, you can see it. Um, and uh, it, that was what that the, the reuse committee came back as. It was supposed to be a, you know, try to keep it as open space. And the, the other parcel, which is now Three Carpenter, I think we're gonna give it to the school committee. To, for, for an elementary school, but they decided they didn't need it. Mm. So it came back to the town. Mr. Pierce. Yeah, I think the, the, the answer to your question you're asking is why those, it's actually location. Uh, uh, anything that we did there would have um, pretty much walking distance to the center of town. So uh, it, um, it, it was a, a good fit for putting up some elderly housing, and we already have some others there. So we thought it might also encourage some of the development downtown. That's kind of what I was waiting to hear. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about it. <laughs> just, just as far as the Parsonage Lane parcel, uh, the town acquired that actually by chance through tax title. And at one point, we were looking to reserve that as a potential uh, expansion or satellite site for cemetery expansion because mm -hmm. we were concerned about um, the useful life of the useful life, so to speak, of, of the cemetery. So we're going to be built out. So I, I think we need to take another Watch. look at that as far as, you know, projection-wise, you know, how, how long do we see the current uh, cemetery uh, location, you know, lasting. And then uh, we held on to this five acres was talked about as a potential uh, future expansion for uh, cemetery. Is that 10 acres or five acres? Five. five. That was five. The red is five. Yeah. 12 parsons is just five acres. So total, totality, it's 10. No, 15. No, 10. Carpenter Drive is 10. Carpenter Drive is 10. Okay, that's what I was asking. Carpenter yeah. Drive is 10. Yeah. Okay. And Parsonage is 5. Mm -hmm. But Parsonage, we did acquire basically through tax title. And uh, again, leave it for open space and, uh, mm -hmm. and or so potential expansion. Back when it was identified as a potential lot for senior housing, was there a um, plan to do a sort of a um, making this all affordable or to bring in some market rates so we can get some affordable what was it was completely affordable, it was um, completely and, the affordable. and the subsidy was, was yeah it was coming from a state grant and there was a partnership with a nonprofit I believe it was Mystic Valley Elder Services Mystic Valley, was. Mystic Valley Elder Services was, was the driving force behind yeah. it yeah <coughs> and I've spoken to Representative Jones and I don't think there's anything on the horizon for something that could as a grant that he's aware of but I know he's looking into it we will continue to follow up with him. I thought we would have this conversation tonight, get back to him because to me, I think there is an immediate action you could take if you construct this, construct this with some market rate units, tie it to affordable units for North Reading residents. This could probably happen sooner than later. If you're gonna wanna wait 
for a grant and do 100% all affordable. First of all, 10 acres, all affordable, that's a lot of units. Today, I think we have 50 affordable units right now for seniors. Is that right? That number sound right? Oh, PB court? No, PB is like 40. And then don't we have some trailers or something? Mm -hmm. No, there's no. just four other units up at the, four units up at uh, Swan Pond. Family. Mm -hmm. So we got 44 at Peabody? Two townhouses. I think <laughs> two, 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 two townhouses up at uh, Swan Park, mm -hmm. which are family units. Does the central place have a handful of affordables? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a component of affordable <coughs> units, okay, at, at all the 40 B's that came through here. Central place, um, there's family housing at uh, Pilgrim Road. Yeah. Uh, we've got over at Edgewood. There's a certain percentage that are, that are set aside as affordable. So every one of the 40 Bs that have already been approved over the years has an affordable component to it. Uh, only the one, or well maybe the one on Elm Street too, were both over 55s. So you want to qualify that as senior. But if you're over 55s was the Elm Street uh, development, where the curve, the Woods Road Farm, and then Central Place. The other ones are just regular affordable units. Mr. Ms. Mullen? Mm -hmm. Oh, Kimberly? You want to just come to the podium? <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, my name is Kim Manzelli, and I'm a North Reading resident. I've lived here about 16 years. Um, I'm a registered nurse, and my professional background is senior care and supportive housing. So when I saw this was on the agenda, I felt it was important to just come up uh, because I've always been a strong <coughs> advocate for aging and the elderly population. Um, and I just wanted to quickly give a couple of thoughts um, and my feedback. Um, I'm newly appointed to the Council on Aging in town and I've been sitting in on the social service action team for several years. Um, just decided to lead the Project 500 subcommittee of the social service action team which is a subcommittee um, that's mission is to focus on the approximately 565 year of age and older residents that are living alone in North Reading. So our mission is outreach and to support these residents. Um, I just felt that it's important to um, let you know that I work at Peter C. Unborn Place in Reading and that's a 62 years and older um, or persons with a disability supportive housing site. I've been there for seven years now. Um, my role right now is a resident care coordinator and what I do is help um, the residents um, have access to referrals, to age in place with digni dignity, and also to um, have wealth, uh, health and wellness programs so they're active and engaged in the community. So it's a, it's a subsidized 73-unit um, uh, facility. Um, I've always felt that North Reading would benefit from some sort of supportive housing similar to this. Um, you know, we, about a year and a half ago, had an adult day health program as well as a home care agency. And those agencies closed, unfortunately, about a year and a half ago. Uh, luckily, I've stayed on and, and been able to keep the community intact and, and bring programs to this community. But I really think that the town of North Reading would benefit from something similar to this type of supportive housing um, that's affordable um, and also would meet the needs of maybe adult day health or some type of enhanced supportive housing. So. I just wanted to let you all know that. Um, we are gonna talk a little bit more about that uh, at our next Council on Aging meeting, uh, the Project 500, as well as taking an initiative for the town to be um, an age-friendly community. There's something out there called um, Massachusetts Healthy Aging Collaborative, and there are many states in Massachusetts that have joined this collaborative effort, um, and it just, gives a formal commitment that the town is focused on an age-friendly community and what are the steps that we can take to to foster that. Mr. Schultz, uh, please stay right there because I couldn't agree more with what you just said and thank you for your service to the town. What I would envision in, I, I know it's hard to do it on 15 acres, but like a miniature version of Brooksby Village mm -hmm. where as your needs 
increase. You can stay in the same facility, maybe go to the next winger. And again, I don't know how, how you can do that on that size parcel, but something along those lines, I would love to see where as our seniors' needs increase, they can still stay in the same <coughs> complex, maybe move to the next building over, what have you. And I think that's kind of what you're talking about a little bit too. That's what I would love to see, and I think that's a great idea for the town. Because you want to see seniors be able to stay in town right. as they get older, as their medical needs, you know, increase. Mm -hmm. right. But to my Andrew, that is sample in place. Yeah, yeah. But my understanding of so a facility like that, I, I don't think. I think we, that would be a little bit more challenging for us because when you have going from independent living to assisted living, in a facility, I, I'm not so sure that we could structure that here and be. And to get, you know, we don't have any money, okay? So we have to pick a path that we could go down that we could get someone to develop this for us to provide us this need, to fill this need. And we have to do it with what we have. And right now we don't have a lot except for the land. So, to, you know, what you're describing, I can't imagine we could get anybody to do it without paying for it. We'd have to, to me, we'd have to pay for that um, based on my research. Um, in a small footprint, we're only dealing with 15 acres. You're not going to have a uh, 15 acres is not small. Well, it's not Brooksby Village, is what I'm saying. It's, it's, you know. Right. But it, it gives you options, but it's not, you can't put Disneyland in there. It's not that big. I understand. But I'm just saying, based on my research, to, to, to do something like that, the town would have to make a significant capital investment to pull that type of a service <coughs> off. But I think if you could do senior housing, to at least use this as the first step, mm -hmm. to build a senior housing that's affordable for our seniors, and you know, I like the idea of the 62 and older. It's a great idea. Um, and if we could build something like that, but Danielle, I think you and I spoke a little bit about it. Am I, am I saying it wrong? I mean, is the research that we've done to do something with, like Mr. Schultz has just described, would be a significant capital investment for the town? I don't know exactly how much that costs. I do know that there are programs that would be available to us from the state to help us finance it. Um, they aren't grants, though. They are loans. They're lower, no interest loans um, over a very long term with deferred payments. That's really what I know about that sort of scenario right now. Um, I don't know what our total costs would be if we were to pursue a facility like facility like that. I can certainly try to find that out. Um, oh, I mean. I'm curious what the board wants to do and what's your vision for a senior outlet, uh, Mrs. Minipelli. I mean, I think I think we should pursue all options. Let's go. Let's do it now. Try these different methods. You have a, a great suggestion. Throw an RFP out for a dollar and see what comes back. We don't have to accept everything. We have the benefit of all these people that have invested all of these years of time in knowing what the community needs. But just like you, before I even got on the board, that was a big you know, issue that kept getting raised and it still is being raised and it's been on our strategic plan since I've been on the board. But I also think my issue with having a development where there's affordable housing mixed with market rate housing, we have enough of that right now. And when, when the JT Berry got purchased, it was built as an over 55 community, which is fantastic and wonderful and beautiful, but may not necessarily be affordable for many single or couple elderly people that want to buy now. It's very, it's a lot of money for, for people that are on fixed income. So I'd prefer to see something where it's really directed just to seniors, obviously to disabled as well, because those seem to be the two um, populations we need to think of. I wouldn't mind uh, sub doing some sort of subsidy, but I also think that there could be a developer out there that wants to develop this, get the land, wants to develop it for the dollar for the type of, uh, you know, the type of development that you're mentioning, that you're mentioning, and they're going to make the income from the residents on their own. Let's try, let's see, let's put it out there and see what comes back. Mr. Pierce. Yeah. Um, since the land, since we own the land, the land cost wouldn't be part of the cost. So, so, so you are correct. It might be possible to get a developer to do that because they, they won't have a land cost. And if we help them with the permitting, which is the biggest thing that slows most developers down, is if we can streamline the permitting for them, again, you'll get a lot more interest. That's one of the big things that slows them down is the permitting processes. 
Um, but these places also generate some income, while it not, might not be a lot. So if we let the uh, Regional Housing Services Office, um, if we tell them that, uh, well, first of all, I want to say we should focus just on the 10 acres. I think that would be a good idea because sure. that keeps the project at a manageable size for now, rather than, you know, try to, because to tie the other one in is going to be costly in, as far as infrastructure goes. So I think let's just focus on the 10 acres right now. Um, so if we do that and we get some input from them, we tell them what our goals are. And, um, and, and, and as far as what you say, Mr. Schultz said, I, I, let's, ask him, <coughs> let's ask him how we do that. And if they say, no, that's too much money, we'll just step back, as you were saying, until we get to a point where we can provide as much as possible with that piece of land. So um, with the, I, I, I would say that with the board's blessing, we, we'll, uh, we'll begin to do some research and do an RFP for it and do some looking into um, what we might be able to do. Yeah, I, I think it is, it is doable to, to create a structure on RFP so it gives options. Oh, and that yeah. way they, I mean, hopefully we can encourage some bids with the options. But you have to think realistically on this, right? Mm -hmm. You're a developer, you're gonna invest money on that property. Even though you're getting in for a dollar, you obviously know the cost of construction is extremely high. Mm -hmm. So you have to have a way to return that investment. And if you do something like a Sambo in place, you're not gonna get the return on that investment very quickly. So you're not gonna get a lot of, I, I want to negotiate against myself here, but I'm just trying to sip from a reality cup. And the reality is that you're probably not getting a lot of bidders. But if you can develop a property for a dollar, then you bring some market value into it, market rate value to it, there's interest. To me, there'd be interest. It would be. But we, if we could structure it where we could create this RFP that says we should dictate. I don't know how many units you could put on these 10 acres and what we have to associate for parking and services. But let's just say it's 80 units or 100 units. Right? If you could take and dictate, right? Today we have 44 houses at Peabody Court. You know, if we could turn the 100 into 50 of them from North Reading residents, it has to be affordable. And we dictate what that affordability is. Lisa leaves another 50 that are at market value, mm -hmm. market rate value, and then they can try to recover their, recoup their, their money. Mm -hmm. Something like that. I don't have all the answers, but that in my mind, I'm thinking that's the most logical path. I don't know how many units you can get in and take it. Well, that, that's that's something. That's why we would work with the people to do this and see, you know, because we're we're we're, we're going to learn how what the best way to do this is, and then we and that's what we'll, then we'll bring something forth that that does the best we can for the town. So I guess one of the questions was, is going to be right up front is whether or not the town would would have any interest in uh, providing some of the funding whether it be through a loan or through our, um, from the state or, or, or what they would do, or if they want to try to make this strictly a commercial uh, enterprise for some developer. In other words, if it's up to the board. I think, yeah. If I may, I think when we get, you put an RFP out, like as Mr. Chairman, I think correctly puts, you, you make it kind of open where the builders can fill in the blanks. And I think that's going to tell us what's out there once we get. Well, I think that the question is going to get asked right up front. Yeah as to whether or not the town, I mean, that, that it's, it's going to be one of the first questions. Yeah, it's going to be. So that's why, uh, that's why we have well, to place that question to you. all how you structure this RFP, yeah. and that's why I'm so bringing you up say, the discussion. If you say, uh, no, we don't think that we can do any of the, uh, can support any of the funding right now, then uh, that's a very important piece of information to how we present this as an RFP, because it means we now have to look at some market units, some way of making it um, profitable enough for somebody to build it. To be able to depend on what they're offering to build, whether I'd be willing to check right. in. I mean, obviously. <coughs> Mrs. Mullen, did you, did you want to say? Yeah, I just wanted to maybe, if we could let like, Jim just uh, say this. As a member of the SSA team for the past few years, we've talked to a lot of different uh, towns that are doing this. I think there's a way that people, uh, people uh, see in one place, had a way that the money was being, if you could afford only 300 or 400 for rent, the government paid for the balance of it. So I said, you can explain it better, because that was one of the things they talked about. We looked at something heavily one time and some other different places. But there is other income coming in. Just right. Yeah. So we're subsidized, um, and I believe it's uh, 202, uh, 202 subsidy. Um, you have to make, I believe it's under $39,000 
uh, would be your annual income to qualify to live at Peter Sanborn Place and your rent is 30% of your income. So the government is subsidizing the other percent. So, you know, it's definitely an affordable um, housing option for seniors and those with disabilities. Uh, handicapped accessible and, um, you know, we do have the supportive services brought in. So it really works very well there. Um, from is the owner getting full rent, whether it's vis-a-vis -vis to the So it's the a mass housing and HUD um, property. Um, it's Danielle may have more to, to the housing authority. add yeah. to the, that. A, you know, I've always a, um, a been the one to provide the care okay. and make sure the care and supportive services are in place. Um, but you have to meet that income eligibility, um, and we're just managed by a property management company. Yeah. Um, but it's mass housing but, and HUD subsidized. But remember, the development was paid for probably by... So United Church Homes um, was a group of um, invested churches many years ago, I want to say 30 years ago, and they own the property. So, you know... Um, and that's what you have to research is how the property is developed, who's funding it. <coughs> right. And what you will learn in that situation, it's most likely was public funds mm -hmm. or some public investment to obtain this, to be able to qualify for a subsidy. Right. And that's what I'm saying here is we have to make a decision tonight what path we want it to go down. Well, we don't have to make a decision tonight. Mm -hmm. We can put this on an agenda for another night to continue to think about it. But what's your path? And to me, the realistic path to me is let's try to structure this where you get a developer to put up all the build money build this structure and then give us some units that are affordable for our residents and then let them have the rest to do whatever they want and to get their money back. That's to me the most realistic path I can foresee. But if we want to go down a different path, then the town has to put something on the table. You have to put some skin in the game. And do we have the ability to do that financially? We probably have to go get it override. Certainly I'd be more than happy to take that on if that's what the people want it to do and go fight for that. But we're at that crossroad, and what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. and that's why I wanted to put us on the agenda tonight, because we got some thinking to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, am I, am I sta stating it wrong? And you, do you, anyone else see it differently than that? Ms. Minnie Pell? I mean, I don't, I don't, I think if we're gonna maintain it as our own, then I think that's where we would put some skin in the game or subsidy mm -hmm. as, as we're referring to. I think that there, there are opportunities if you do put out an RFP, there would be potential response, you know, responding parties that might develop it, uh, be it a building or, you know, be it uh, combined assisted living slash rental units and things like that. Um, I think that, that you just have to put it out there and, and see, but I don't necessarily think we would be subsidizing anything that we're not going to be keeping as our own, mm -hmm. much like Phoebe Court. So if we're going to keep it, if that's what we want to now become our, own, our landlord, I could see that. Otherwise, we're going to sell it to a private developer who's going to come forward and tell us what they can put there. And our skin in the game is, here you go for a dollar. And there will be people that will, I think, respond to that. It's a, it's a money-making industry. Otherwise, people wouldn't be doing it. Right. So, you know, if I could add go my the, concern. Go to the podium if you okay. want to be addressed, <laughs> and I'll recognize you. If go to the podium. My uh, concern is that, you know, there aren't a lot of affordable options here for the seniors in town or handicapped accessible options. Um, I've been in many homes with home care aides uh, when Sanborn Home Care was in business. Uh, Peabody Court is an accessible handicap wise you can't even no. get into the bathrooms with a walker or a wheelchair um, many of the residents that I saw in their homes I was shocked actually to be a resident here for this many years and to go into homes and it looked great on the outside but there's a lot of um, need for just another option and these people are all here supporting <coughs> the town I think we owe it to the, the residents to give them an option to downsize or have, have something affordable. Absolutely. You're highlighting why Ms. we need to do Ms. something. Ms. Pickle, <coughs> please. 
Just state your name. Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Christine Pacora, and I live here in North Reading. I am a third generation North Reading resident. Um, my grandmother actually lived at 33 Peabody Court. Uh, she moved there in 1977, so she lived there for a very long time. So I'm very familiar with the apartments. I don't think they've changed much since um, since I've been there. <laughs> same, um, li same linoleum on the floor. Same, exactly. <laughs> I think the only time anything gets changes is when somebody maybe passes away or moves to um, an assisted living facility. So I think that, um, that First of all, this isn't the reason why I came up because I there were, I just had one question, but I do think that the if you look at where PBD Court is now, it's between a beautiful bachelor school and the beautiful middle and high school, and we have these apartments that are for the elderly who gave so much so that we could have these schools for our children. I think that you know the town really needs to move forward and and do something for the people who helped our children. Um, but what I did want to say is, once all this gets going, what's going to happen to the Peabody Court property? Is that something that you can use, um, at, you know, as a bargaining? No, you, what's going to happen to that land? Well, I, obviously, we would have to make a decision what the reuse of that property would be. No, we don't have any say. The no, state owns that, state property. Owns that the property. The town of North right. Reading does not own Peabody Court. Right. Um, it's state-owned, state-run. Right. Right. Okay. It is not, but we have no control over the property or the units or what happens okay. with it. It has to be okay. in concert with the in state. order to be yeah. part of yeah. the equation. <coughs> so I don't think that's going to be an issue, though. I can't imagine it's going to be an issue. Based on the conversations we had during their site visit, they certainly felt if we could find, identify another parcel to move it to, that they certainly wouldn't have no use for that property and that it would be, we would just work it out. I don't think that's going to be an issue. <coughs> I mean, what's the state going to do? States well, well, what, you know, what, the question is, what has the state done to date? The state hasn't done anything for the town of North Reading and affordable senior housing in 45 years right. or more. Yeah. I mean, those those units were built in 1960, I think. Well, you know, so and there's been nothing other than those four family units, so those two duplexes. That's all that the state has invested in the town of North Reading for affordable housing for the residents of the town of North Reading. That's it. Yeah. You know, so you know, for 50 years. You know, so the state has fallen behind, state and federal government, fallen behind on affordable housing. And it's, you know, falling upon people of conscience here trying to address the situation. And again, you have to partner with, I found, uh, you know, with, with nonprofits in order to get things mobilized, moving, and get the grants or subsidies or breaks in the loans in order to make them cost effective. The, the, the entrepreneur, it's not there for them. And again, if you look at, the assisted living facilities now, and the ones that have the, the tiered systems, they don't expect uh, uh, they don't accept um, Medicaid. They're all private pay. You know, Brooksby Brooksby Village is a little bit different. What they do is you buy the unit in there, and then as you progress along, if by the end of the time, what you paid for the unit could go towards your care towards the end, they have it all figured out. You know, there's a an equation as to how long they anticipate a resident's going to be there. You know, they will then accept Medicaid. You know, if you can qualify for Mass Health and you run out of money, but that the occurrence of that is very, very small. So they can afford to do that because everything else is a cash flow. It works. Um, you know, I've got two family members now that are in assisted living, but it's all private pay. And as soon as their money runs out, you know, you're then looking at a nursing home and you have to spend down to two thousand dollars. So. And again, I don't know how the, the one in Reading operates, but it's obviously subsidized through state and federal money managed by a property company, uh, I mean, a property management uh, group, but you know, it's all state and federal money is subsidized. You know? So it's like a Section 8 housing where you, you get a certificate, you qualify for income, you pay one third of your income towards it, and the rest of it's subsidized through the government. Um, that doesn't happen generally with a new development model. Great. So, I that was just my question. I, I didn't realize it was state. To, so you know, I, I don't know what kind of control the town yeah, has so over that later on. But no it's we, right. We, obviously, we, if we were able to move it, we would advocate to obtain that parcel from the state. But I, I don't see that as the biggest problem. I think us finding a solution is the big problem. Oh no, and, I definitely. And the, okay. No, and I and I know, and the state is frustrated. I'm frustrated with the state because 
they're not giving us many options or any options at all actually except occasionally a grant may come up you know when we had them out for our site visit they didn't have any ideas they were, you know, there is no money and that's all they kept saying if you could build it move it we'll help and support once it's in, in its location but outside of that do, would the state consider selling it to a private developer? I, you know, I, I think that's like some, another part of this picture is what's that going to then end up looking like in the town center? I mean, you know, you all remember what the big deal was building the batch and how difficult that was because it was in the historical center. So, you know, are these, is that now going to sit empty and how, you know, if it's all state P control. PD Quest not part of the historic district, so we'll be subject <laughs> to that. Okay, yeah. oh, that's not, okay. Just outside. All right, yeah. so anyway, that was, I just wanted to add that. I wasn't sure, thanks. I'm sorry, missed meeting that, I'll get to you. John, please. Yeah. Yeah. My name is John Meany from uh, North Reading. Uh, my, I grew up in North Reading. My parents, my mother still lives on uh, Pleasant Street. Uh, my mother's 83 and, um, I guess it's just a statement and a question. She really never, you know, in other towns, I guess, like Linfield and stuff like that, where my in-laws are from, there's a, a list you can get on and be available for senior housing, like affordable, I, I wouldn't even say affordable, maybe like somewhat market value, but at a, um, say, marketplace where they built some apartments and condos, and then they had built a, um, a building just for, I think it was over 55 or over 60, and there's a rate that you pay for your, say, was $400,000 maybe, or $385,000. And then if you leave there at some point, whether you pass away or move on, the, um, it can only go up a certain percentage. So it's controlled pricing, it's not, low income housing, but it's some place where your seniors can go. Um, and I may be wrong, but I don't think there's any place like that in North Reading. And there's a lot of families in North Reading that are not poor, that can afford a place like that, but really didn't have any place to move into, and my mother being one of them. And you might be able to get into a place now, say at the new place they're building on 62, but I'm not sure that's controlled for like a list where the next people come and only, you know, it's almost like a market value. To, uh, it's not market value, it only goes up a certain percentage when it gets sold. So um, it would be affordable for the next level of seniors that come in and take over. So I'm not sure if we have anything like that in town, but that, that was kind of my question. Still there. Yeah. We, we do. Some of the. Uh, the 40B projects, which have been approved over the last several years, have an affordable component. Again, they're not rental properties, not the rental ones, but the, the uh, condos. Yep. Um, the subsidized <coughs> units, again, are sold at below market rates uh, with, when they're deemed affordable. And again, there's a cap on the resale value as to what can happen for the next sale. So there are units in North Reading that are subject to those, those caps, but you have to wait for the unit to become vacant. And then, uh, so is there, is there a senior list that you can get on for that? Or is it anyone over 55? I believe or there is are, it, you there have are, to be a town resident. That's there's there's a small control. number of units that are, uh, that the housing authority is aware of. Yeah. There were a couple of units that the housing authority actually purchased a couple of years back out of Main Street. I think they had two units know, that they utilize for the same purposes. But I think what they've been using them for is more, not for, for sale, mm -hmm. but again, for rental people, low-income people, low-income seniors. Um, it all depends on how the 40B units mm -hmm. and uh, developers were, uh, what they agreed to in their, in their agreement. But those units that are affordable, designated as affordable, are sold at below market rates, and can only be resold at below market rates with a certain cap on percentage above what the original owner paid for. So there are some of those available, but they're all handled through private yeah. thing and deed restrictions. Yeah. More and through so deed restrictions in, in than Winfield, else. as I know, there's a list where you get on, you put your name on it. If you are a resident or related to a Winfield resident, uh, somehow related, and but there is like uh, there's hundreds of units available to the seniors 
Linfield's a different town, I understand that, but there's the place right in downtown, uh, right off the center, and then there's the place at Market Street, and I think there's actually one other place off uh, down past the 99 down there, there's another facility. It might be a little bit different, but very similar, and they're very nice communities, but it's not for the people that are, you know, need all the support. It's people that want to stay in town, that have lived in town forever, like my parents, like myself, maybe someday. So we we, we so. had an opportunity not too long ago, yeah. just about a year ago, where Pulte had offered, mm. this is for home ownership, <clears throat> a, an affordable component, mm. you know, and uh, the board opted to go for the 30 million instead of the 18 and a half, 18 and a half million dollars. Yeah. Uh, but again, Pulte did, pro did provide mm. an opportunity for this town to have over 55 mm. subsidized housing for senior for seniors mm. and the majority of the board uh, did not go for the 30 million okay. deal with it later okay. but we did have that opportunity yeah. and maybe potentially there's another opportunity at the one down in elm street i don't really know much enough about that i just started hearing about it maybe a week but ago the one but down on elm street does have some affordable units in it yeah. and when they are to be resold yeah. they're going to be sold at below market rates uh, with the deed restrictions on it. Okay. Thank you. Did you want to answer? Yeah, Mr. Media, I, just to answer your question, uh, I've, as a real estate attorney, I've conveyed a number of those types of properties in the Boston area. Generally speaking, they, there's a municipal agency that will approve the people that are the new buyers. There is usually a list with each town. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how North Reading does it, but other towns I've seen that. And as Mr. O'Leary stated, there are riders in the deed where they can only attain an appreciation off of their price. You right. know, so if everything went up 10%, they can get 10% more when they sell. But they're sold on the market, but the, the buyers do have to be approved, and usually the buyers are provided by the agency that's monitoring that particular housing unit. And generally it's the housing authority, and again, it's income driven, which, which qualifies them for those affordable units. So we're not sure if there is a list in North Reading that, that applies to that? I don't know I, the answer to that question. I think there may be. There is. <laughs> <coughs> there is a list for people interested in um, units as of the affordable units, as the subsidized units, as they become available. Um, and if, if there is anyone who would like to be on the list, um, they can contact me and I can put them in touch with the Housing Services Office staff who keeps a list of interested buyers. When these units come on the market and we become aware of them, um, those you know, possible potential buyers are contacted and made aware of lotteries and such that, that happen. So. Great. And right down here, if you pass that microphone down, and then Mr. Wellner after you. Yeah, I just wanted to say with regards to the RFP for this property, does it make sense to link the two properties together for a developer, as in, you know, develop the preferred solution for three carpenter being elderly housing and perhaps provide more leeway on the Parsonage Lane project for, you know, uh, non elderly housing or just a, you know, general apartment or condo development <coughs> that way you're incentivizing the developer providing an avenue towards more profit to potentially get uh, more units on carpenter i know mr pierce you said earlier you'd rather us hold on to that property and don't do anything with it that's a great question yeah one of the one of the thoughts on that was to limit the um the size the size and scope of the project on a, um, to something that we could afford, first of all. And second of all, um, if it looked like something could be worked out, you could look at using that piece of property. But that, that, that second piece of property is a little more, is a little more uh, difficult to develop than the, uh, than the 10 acres is too. So it might not be as much of an incentive because of the topography of it. So, um, uh, so I wouldn't have any problem with that kind of a concept um, if you wanted that kind of density in there, but you, but you know, that's, that you're gonna. Well, I think it's important to understand though that this neighborhood has already uh, endured a significant amount of development in a 40B project directly abutting this, par right, this right. property. Right. And um, you know, as we're proposing this, you know, and before we go off for an RFP, I think we need to, you know, we brainstorming here, which is good in public, which is important um, step in the right direction. But I think we need to include that neighborhood in relation to what they would deem an impact 
And, uh, and again, they're very familiar with uh, dealing with the 40Bs because a number of them were involved and are still living there as far as the negotiations with the developer mm -hmm. and minimizing the impact uh, on their neighborhood for the, what, what was proposed there. So same, same goes here. I mean, what you're doing is you're proposing a 40B here, yeah. basically. And what would be an impact? Five acre pieces like a what five would acre? be a definition of an impact? Well, you're talking, I don't care if it's 24 units or, or 124 units. You know, in a, in a residential single family home with a, you know, anywhere from a half acre to acre lots in the neighborhood, and you're looking, you know, you're talking density, you're talking uh, traffic, you know, entrance, egress, you know, how are people going to come through the neighborhoods? Is it going to be out on Central Street, or is it going to be coming down Parsonage? You know, um, what's going to have for screening? Uh, what's the building going to look like? How high is it going to be? There's a whole host of, um, of impacts on neighborhoods. You know, to, to everything from what's the building going to look like, how big, how many stories, and uh, how much light is it going to throw off into the neighborhood. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Walden. Because um, she's going to say the same thing as me. Parts of Need to go to the well, mic. I think I can give a little bit of a, like Maureen Doherty edited of the transcript. I think I give a little enlightenment about what um, John Meany was talking about. Um, in Linfield, it's called uh, LIFE. Linfield Initiative for Elders, Inc. They have a board of directors, and it started back in uh, 1983 uh, with Center Village. When you're driving um, into Linfield Center, um, there used to be the Center School um, around 19, the early 1980s. That school was shuttered, knocked down, and they built uh, basically like um, apartments. They look like townhomes from, from the outside. They're like three stories. Um, and then they created Essex Village, a few years later, there's 66 units there. There's 60 in Center Village. And then they created Colonial Village, uh, which has 48 units. And then um, the fourth component of that, which this doesn't seem to be have been caught up with, um, th there's the, whole, the concept of Market Street, which is each, each one is a little more um, upscale. Uh, Upscale, yes, upscale. So uh, but there is a, like there, it is limited um, to, to town residents are the only ones who can get on that list, and it's a, the waiting list is a long time. So how do we? Oh, no, sorry. I'm sorry. How um, do we do something like that? How, no, how they they know it's it's they buy it, they own it, and then the when they resell it, they get that little bit of um, kick up. You know, you're limited to what your return is on your investment, like. You're, if you make upgrades, like say you bought a, a affordable unit and you you get all standard appliances. If you on your own put in stainless steel appliances, when you go to resell, you're not gonna get the credit for stainless steel because you did that on your own. You know, um, that, that's the way the 40Bs work. You know, so there's a, there's a, there's a formula um, that, you know, they go in and they, uh, the, uh, life goes in and they, you know, freshen it up, update it, um, and then they sell it, and, the, you know, <coughs> so life it's... Is that life a non-profit? It is a non-profit, it, non it, it has a board of directors, and they have a whole website page. Uh, just take a second to Google it. Um, so, that's, that's very helpful. I'm what sure the, the town of Linfield would be able to tell you. Um, Joe Maney is, um, he's the former town administrator over there, and he's, um, like, a longtime resident, and he, he's... He tried to get himself on the list, and he, I, you know, last I heard, he wasn't in one of the units yet, so he was still in his own house. Mrs. Um, Vinnie Pelly. But did you want to say something? No, I was just curious what Maureen knew if they were they're owned by the nonprofit. So I, I don't know. If they're all they're owner occupied. I, I mean, I'm sorry, but initially it's, developed by the nonprofit. In other words, um, I'm not I'm not sure it's how. It's a private how, corporation. Yeah. So the town sold to the. Corporation to yeah. build this specific, and that's what I'm talking about. That, that would be, I think, something that half price, half price market units. Um, that uh, you have to be two-year resident of Linfield or um, be a have another mic. Rich to, to the microphone. So Rich Walner, 57 Lakeside. It's uh, delightful to hear us talking about senior housing, the needs of seniors. Um, I see some of the people that I meet with for the last four or five years here talking as well. Um, the topic of senior housing is very uh, thick, very detailed. There's many needs in the senior housing community. 
We've heard of one version, which is Life out of Linfield. They do a very proactive version of housing. It's definitely very much supported by the town. It's half market units. It's only for Linfield residents. They make it town preference only. It has its advantages. What Kim describes is supporting services. It's one piece of the pie of people who are in need of services. And that, especially for a more, more remote location, that can be a very attractive thing as well. And what Steve is talking about is um, Brooksby Village, what you were talking about is a continuous care retirement community. And that has four components. You move in independent living, meaning you come in healthy. Then you can go to assisted living. You go to the memory care unit, or you go to nursing home. And what you hope to have happens actually is you come in independent and you leave and get your money back at the end of the day, or your family does. Um, probably not realistic for this property because it has to be pretty big. And Brooksby went belly up about 10 years ago. I think the residents had to take over um, ownership of that. So there's always been some question about how that model works in the long right. run. But it does work, and they seem to be stable over the last 10 years. So the point is, is that, again, I, I feel like I'm repeating myself because I've been in front of you guys too much recently. Um, these are great discussions. We have a thorough study that came out of MP MAPC that goes over the housing. Um, I think that it, I, I'm suggesting that it's probably premature to throw out some money for an RFP at this point. I think it's good we have this on the table. I think it's great that we're talking about senior housing, but I think all of these elements have to work together. If you think of life in example, they created the, those apartments, those, those condos, and then they built the marketplace right next to it. Why did they do that? Was that an accident or that, was that intended to be happening? That was an intentional thing. One fed the other. So in all these cases, we're talking about moving the chess pieces around. Kim talked about how, um, Chris, Christine did, about how like when you leave one building empty, what are you gonna do with that? We're so close on having the MAPC study done that it would be great to have one big, let's sit down and look at all the pieces and try to put all the pieces together into one master plan and then go out for your RFP and do all the RFPs you have to do. But it feels like it's a little bit premature, although this is a great discussion. It's nice to know that this is uh, fairly complicated. It's not an easy not an easy thing to fix. Yeah, but I believe the, M I mean, the study you're doing won't answer this question. It won't. It won't. It won't. We'll, it's we'll an apples and oranges. Right. We'll, we'll have to get the information. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. This, this study won't answer what you're saying. It will not accomplish what you're cool. saying. It will. Well, there's, uh, there's, um, there's numbers associated with people, seniors. Who yeah, we, no, I think we have a good idea on that. But, but I'd like to move on and uh, before I give some homework assignments out, uh, <laughs> Mrs. Minipelli. No, I just wanted to, just to kind of add to the idea of what's been talked about a little bit more. I know in Malden, the, Malden actually had its own municipal run nursing home called McFadden Manor. And it went out of business essentially. Um, that there, there was a home rule to have it tried to be taken over, but it did by a, a senior committee. But it didn't work out, and Malden ended up selling it to a company called Volunteers of America, which is a nonprofit that kind of refurbished or redid it to very similar to what you were speaking about, or the you know the different levels of care, so that someone could go in and get a unit who was fully able, but someone could go in and get a unit to, to have assisted living. But it, it's quite different than this. It was very small. It was, you know, it, it, was a, it was a nursing home already. It was a very, it was a very tiny, tiny footprint. But, but there are companies out there that might definitely be interested in, in doing something with this parcel. So I think it's, I didn't expect us to come on any solution tonight. Just wanted to get the conversation started. We have a lot more on the agenda, so I'd like to try to wrap. Oh, and I'm going to wrap it up now. But if we could leave it with a little bit of action on your end, and maybe Michael, uh, if you don't mind, maybe even reaching out to the Linfield Town Administrator to just sort of learn a little bit more from them. I know we have our uh, CIT group, we have our Council on Aging, we have our Elderly Affairs uh, Department head. You know, at some point we got to get everybody sitting around a table. I'd, I'd like to do that, and then try to come back here again jointly and continue this conversation after the new year. So um, we'll figure out when that right time is, but if you could in the meantime, look into a little bit of the nonprofit stuff, see if we can. Um, you mean look into some of how the supportive housing would be funded, um, how much it would be and you know how that would work. Yeah. Um, also, and if 
so I, we weren't going to be looking into Linfield Life, but did you say that you would I, rather I'm going to ask the town administrator to reach okay. out uh, to, I think it would be good for his counterpart okay. and, and Linfield to just sort of, you know, maybe connect us with the right people. And if we have to go do a site visit over there, I'd be more than happy to uh, accompany everyone over. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. The regional service office uh, is probably going to have, uh, going to know about this as well, about the Linfield situation. I think that probably just touching base with them, giving them an idea. We've had this conversation, and that we're looking for some options, yep. which is why I try to pin you down a little on, on, on and where you were with it, so that because then they can come back and say, "Here are some options, and give us some things to put on the table to look at." And uh, Mr. Uh, in, uh, Representative Jones has already connected us. We already have the points of contact in the housing, um, so we know who to contact when we and we will bring them into the fold as well. And then we can also start the conversations about what to do with the existing PPD court at some point as well, bringing them into the fold. Yes. Just one more thing that I think I think we, from my perspective, we should be possessive of this land for our residents, not necessarily for other people to come in, but just to have affordable housing for our seniors. Or do you know what I mean? I understand, but the problem with that is you have to put up an investment. So if you have, if you want to do that, then I look forward to you proposing to us where that investment comes from, because that's the only way you get that done. You may have a little bit more information based on your meetings, but I'm hoping that what we get from the people that are going to be researching yeah. this will help us inform how to put the RFP yeah. out. If I could quickly, for what Mr. Mancello said, uh, perhaps the question might be, how did Linfield start a nonprofit? Because maybe what we need to do is, is the same maybe thing. Maybe start a nonprofit. Set up a nonprofit, look for funding for it for this particular item, and, and, uh, and, and work it that way. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. So maybe I agree. That's the answer. That's well, what we're going to do. So we'll get this back on the agenda again soon. Thank you for participating. Yeah. And uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Next, we're going to go to, um, we're going to do the Speedway real quick, if that's OK. Well, we have these folks here. We don't want to make them wait any longer. Then we're going to go to 217 Main Street real quick, and then we're going to spend the rest of the evening with our friends from water. Okay? So uh, change your manager. Michael? Thank you. Um, Mrs. Man oh, yeah, Tom, wait, did you need? I was wondering if I or we would be needed for 217 Main Street before. Uh, I would welcome the leave. planning commissioners to stay for an update relative to that. This property. change of manager should be quick. And we're going to go right to 217 Main Street. Uh, Mr. Gilberto. Mr. Chairman, through you. Um, it looked like there might have been a question in the audience. <laughs> Sorry. I'll let you be the chairman. <laughs> uh, through you, um, we have a, uh, a change of manager for uh, Speedway located out on Main Street. I believe that they do have their attorney here representing them. Um, uh, this uh, action is required in order for us to proceed with the renewal with the new uh, manager designated. Sure. And I believe the individuals here this evening. I'll turn it over to Attorney Upton. This has actually been an annual event, I think. I believe it has been, yes. <laughs> Please, right to the podium. Sometimes more than annual. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Andrew Upton, representing Speedway. Uh, with me is Evigan Nieves, the proposed manager of record. Also uh, with us is Sean Afalabi, the district manager for Speedway in this area. Um, Evigan has been with Speedway for 13 years. Uh, he's very experienced with the sale and of age-restricted products. Uh, he's worked in stores that sold tobacco for the last 12 years. He's been at this place uh, for just about four months, and they've decided to promote him to the manager of record on a liquor license. Uh, he is TIPS trained. He has completed Speedway's in-house liquor licensing and liquor sales training. Uh, he's a strict supervisor of his staff. They use scanning devices uh, and mystery shoppers at the store. Uh, he's had a good record everywhere he's been, and we're glad to answer any questions. Okay. Mr. O'Leary? Mr. Chairman, I move to approve a change of manager for the package store wine and malt beverage license for Speedway, 231 Main Street, from Nicholas Tarallo <coughs> to Vegan Nevis. 
Second. A motion. I have a second. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you Thank for you. coming in. Thank you. Thank Sorry you. for the wait. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. We all need to sign that? Okay. Next, we're going to go to discuss briefly, very briefly, 217 Main Street. I'm going to turn it over to Town Administrator, and then I may fill in a few little comments, and then we'll move on. Certainly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, through you. Uh, as uh, the community is aware, there's been um, an ongoing uh, deliberation relative to the property located at 217 Main Street. Uh, the select board made a determination at the end of November that the property was unique for meeting the town's municipal needs, specifically relative to public safety and or public works uh, operations, as well as uh, potential um, relocation of some uh, office locations that are uh, office functions that are currently here in the town hall, uh, some of those offices, I should say. And uh, the select board has been uh, conducting deliberations in executive session, which have been publicly posted uh, relative to this property. And um, we're pleased to report that uh, subject to uh, the agreement of a purchase and sale agreement between the town and the seller, uh, we have uh, made an offer that has been accepted uh, for this uh, property. Um, it's important to note that there are a number of contingencies that are relative to this offer. Um, and as I said in, uh, initially, it is subject to the agreement of a purchase and sale agreement between the town specifically the board uh, and the uh, seller. Um, but uh, I'll give some highlights relative to the, uh, the nature of the, the framework that we've uh, uh, come to an agreement uh, on uh, for the edification of the public. Um, the uh, proposed uh, sale price for the property is $3,533,000. Uh, the sale is uh, subject to the the negotiation or agreement on a purchase and sales agreement, which the board will be asked to uh, sign on behalf of the town before January 16th. In the framework, there would be a 55-day period for the town to conduct what I'll call uh, due diligence, where we uh, would be able to inspect the property and to make determinations relative to um, its suitability for uh, public purposes. Uh, that would, uh, our intention is to include uh, evaluating uh, the need for uh, any work to be done on the property so that it could um, be uh, outfitted for municipal needs. And then uh, assuming um, the um, determination by the select board that it um, property meets our needs, um, there would then be a, a window of time uh, within which we would need to have a town meeting uh, vote, uh, and the intention is for sorry, special, town special excuse me a special town meeting vote, uh, which we're tentatively uh, targeting for uh, April 2nd. Uh, the board's not going to be asked to call that town meeting at this point in time because of the due diligence period that we'll be going through, um, with a goal of um, again having that that meeting on April uh, April 2nd. Um, one component of this is that uh, we'll be requesting of the Finance Committee uh, a, a reserve fund transfer to uh, fund uh, the evaluation of the, uh, any improvements that may be required to the property so that we'll be able to report to the community uh, at town meeting what those uh, improvements are likely to cost um, and potentially uh, ask for funding for those improvements at the same time as we request approval and authorization of funding to acquire the property. Um, this obviously is something that is unanticipated from a scheduling standpoint. Um, as we indicated in November, it is an opportunity that uh, we were looking at um, informally, um, and uh, obviously the board has made the determination based on the information that's been provided that the property uh, is indeed unique to address uh, municipal needs. Um, with uh, that, the next step will be the request of the Finance Committee, which is uh, going to be taken up at their meeting tomorrow evening, I believe, Mr. Robert. Um, so we look forward to meeting with them. And I think that covers it, right? That was good. Any brief questions? Brief? Ms. David? Now you never I'm just going to make a statement. Brief? Yeah. I have to put you on the clock? Sure. All right. Go ahead. Since you all just, you all kind of reappointed me as uh, 
on the Economic Development Committee as an associate, we're taking 2.88 acres out of the tax rolls by going here. We know that for the water, you need a very small parcel for a small building to inject chlorine, which is, you're going to build two very similar buildings, one on Central and one somewhere on Main Street. But we're taking a big piece of our, and a beautiful property for redevelopment, for economic, in economic development. I mean, you, you come all the way around to Plymouth Street, there's a, another uh, small parcel there that could connect the larger parcel to Plymouth Street. I just, I have an issue that way for this. I understand we have other needs, but I, I we, you know, this suddenly popped up as we got these needs, let's spend the three million dollars buy this piece of property, but we forget that we're taking a big chunk of tax base out. I, I think if you, from a distance, I could see folks looking at it that way. Um, but you have to understand that we, we've known for a long time that we do have some municipal needs in town. And one of them is the fire station. And the location of a fire station is very important for access to the main roads to be able to respond quickly. So this debate about finding another location for the fire department's been long ongoing, even well before I arrived on this board nine, almost nine years ago. So you have to attend to that solution at some point. And you know, no one was out looking at this time. This building just came around. And based on the structure of this building, it, it, it could fit this need very, very nicely. Because to go out and buy this piece of property for three point, or just say it's less than $3.5 million, you could never build that structure and keep it within the $3.5 million. It certainly could not happen. So this is an opportunity that's worth losing some economic development. And believe me, I am a big proponent of the economic development. But this is a sacrifice I think that's worthy of happening because we need a centralized location. We, that's why we're doing this due diligence as well. We're going to do some GIS mapping. We're going to look at where these calls are, how, where our call volume is. So we find the right central location for this fire department. And we have to do all this due diligence in the next 55 days. And I think you will be happy and, and surprised once we provide this data and you may feel differently when we're done. And maybe you won't, but that's okay. We as a board, we have to make those decisions and not everyone's gonna be happy with this. We understand it. That's why it's our responsibility to do the due diligence, present it at a special town meeting to justify our actions. And, and I believe there is no doubt in my mind that this is, I know it was off the radar, but when an opportunity came up like this, it was very hard for us to pass it up. Until we finish this due diligence process, I'd ask everyone to just give us the latitude to let us go through this process, see what we present at special town meeting. And we're certainly gonna hold some workshops between now and special town meeting to share the information as it becomes available. So you can have more questions and we can invent it, invent ourselves and make sure we are prepared on April 2nd. Okay, so I'm gonna move on. I'm going to um, bring Chair, up. Chair, I'd just like to yes. make a comment in relation to this. Uh, a couple of things. One is, I supported uh, going forward with uh, the feasibility study and, and requesting of the finance committee to, you know, take a look at it. Um, but you know, I too am somewhat of a skeptic. But at the same time, you know, this is an opportunity that has presented itself, and the timing is such that we have to either fish or cut bait. And so the majority of the board has decided to, you know, let's go fishing for a little bit here and see what, see what bites. And so I think it's important that we be given the opportunity, and I think we have a responsibility to do the due diligence uh, before we pass on this opportunity. I think the way that the, uh, the structure of the uh, purchase and sale agreement, as it will be structured, uh, provides the town with a marvelous opportunity to take a look at it, and also uh, low risk in relation to uh, uh, the necessity to actually exercise uh, the option to purchase. So, you know, just a few questions. Does it fit and how does it fit into our master plan? Um, those types of things. Uh, methodology and the method of financing the purchase and the build out, I'm very concerned about, as everybody here is, and uh, that's going to be vetted uh, prior to town meeting. And then again, we await to, well, we have some ideas, you know, internally, uh, 
within town hall as to what the potential uses are, uh, potentially could be. Uh, I think this study will assist us in seeing what will fit. So um, nothing's been cast in stone here, but I think it's just an opportunity that we saw and an opportunity that we think we should avail ourselves of as far as taking a look and expending some funds to, to, to see what the potential is there. Uh, but again, we're not at risk of losing any money other than what we spent on these uh, feasibility studies and consultants. So uh, that being said, we're going to have a whole lot of discussion about it between now and April 2nd. We won't do it in a vacuum. One quick point. I'll be quick. Yes, sir. Um, every single master plan we've ever done since I've been on the planning board has included a fire station of some kind on the west side of town. And we're hoping our GS, GIS mapping will help us even identify that even more. I mean, just so somebody won't think that it's something you just thought up. You know, I mean, it's, it's been thought about for many, many, many years. Yes. And, the look, and the place has been looked for for it. Yep. And anytime anyone's interested in going to our existing fire station, even though we just made a significant capital investment to clean it up, to put a Band-Aid on it, um, Go look at it. Go go visit it. You know, and our call volume isn't going down; it's going up. And um, you know, it's it's time. And the opportunity is good, but again, it's on us in the next 55 days to prove to the community that this is a worthy investment in our board members too, because there is some skepticism on this board as well. Uh, okay, next we're going to have the discussion on the water project and the update on the water replacement project and I want to apologize to Mark Clark and your your team for the delay in getting you up to uh, the podium this evening I apologize uh, I guess the question is mr. chairman which would you like to hear first I think the best thing to do is the water meter replacement program real quick and then we'll get into the water project and uh, wrap it up that way if you don't mind I think I assume the water meter replacement programs are going to be pretty vanilla, hopefully. Thanks again, Thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Sorry, Mark. We'll just give it a minute to let the state slowly leave. <laughs> Boy, I give you a hot time tonight. <laughs> You're used to it. I just have to bring that up. I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did. Oh, thank you. I, I, I got you. I'm tracking with you. Can I? Good evening. Mr. Clark. All right, good evening. Um, this is an update on the water meter project. I'm hoping to be quick on it. So the project itself, it's to replace all the existing water meters in town with this new AMI, which means Advanced Metering Infrastructure System. Uh, we have 4,853 commercial and residential meters, most of which date back to the last meter replacement in the early 1990s. Obviously, there's been a lot of development since then, so some of the homes have newer meters. Um, some of the commercial properties actually have older meters than that. So we're trying to just basically bring everything up to a current generation. Uh, North Reading, we, we traditionally wait till there's a tried and true uh, system out there and then upgrade to that. Uh, up at the top, you can see our kind of our most recent upgrade. Uh, it was a Neptune meter with the black ARB boxes. That's what most people have had on the outside of their houses for, for a long time. Uh, she brought one. So these have been in service since the early 1990s. This one actually we just took out today, just changed the meter today. Um, Basically, the, the reading system with this is we'd have to go out to these, open them up, there's a series of pins inside, we pl plug a gun on, it reads the account number and the meter reading, downloads it to our system. <coughs> Functional system, it's been in, in service for 27, 28 years, and uh, again, this one was sitting on that house for that long, working fine until we took it away. Um, but we're going to the newer system, which you see on the bottom, which again is a Neptune meter. Uh, with a radio reading device on the outside of the house. That's what that gray box is if you see it on the outside of your house. I actually have one of those as well. And these, we've actually been installing radios for about seven years here in North Reading, so any new construction, any meter replacements, we're changing these out. Um, 
The system we've used is what's known as a drive-by system. So we have kind of this big radio receiver that we drive down the street with. It bounces off. It has about an 800-foot radius that it'll read on. So if I turn this on today, uh, it'll read everything within about 800 feet of town hall here. Yeah, we used to use that as I call it. Uh, this project was approved a few years ago at town meeting. Uh, it's funded through the water enterprise. Uh, there's basically four uh, kind of parties involved, the town of North Reading. I have uh, Margaret McCarthy from Weston and Sampson, who's been our engineer. She's with us here in the audience today. Uh, we have Thai Sales, which is basically the meter supplier and the, the radio supplier. And then the people that have been dealing with you at your homes in North Reading have been uh, Thels Engineering, but really USI Services, which is a subcontractor to them. They're the people that were on the postcard that you've called to make the, uh, make the appointments. They're the people who are actually in the homes to do those meter replacements. So what is AMI? It's, it's, you know, you hear the term smart meter as well. So it basically takes and rather than have uh, us come out to your house to read it, it basically reads itself, stores the readings, and then once a day that information is transmitted through communication infrastructure. We basically have some repeaters on the three water towers and on a couple of uh, power poles in town that basically read all the uh, information once a day and it dumps to a, a dedicated server here in, in town hall. So we're getting, we're actually getting reads from the whole town every day. We're actually getting hourly reads from the whole town and that's kind of one of the big benefits of this. So the old meter reading system if you saw your bills, we always billed you to the nearest 1,000 gallons because that was as close as the older meters would allow us to read. The new meter reading system, we can read down to a tenth of a gallon. Um, so it's 10,000 times more resolution on the meter reading. Uh, the frequency, we would walk the town four times a year, so we would get four meter readings per year. The newer system, we're getting 24 meter readings every day, so we're up to 8,760 points of data every year. Um, Meter reading technology, we had the old pin blocks. Um, as, as I mentioned, we have some drive-by radios in. Uh, there's still some manual reading meters where we'd have to go out and write down the reading and bring it back. And there's some, some basically non-standard meters in town, um, mostly at the Greens. The Greens kind of uh, did an upgrade on their system a few years back that was not really the standard we have in town. New meter reading system, again, it's a fixed network the uh, collectors are on the towers and they sit there. We can actually sit here in town hall and do an on-demand reading. So if Ms. Manupelli was selling her house, we could sit here and read your reader. We don't have to get up and drive out and do the meter reading at your house for that. Just a, sum <clears throat> a summary of where we are. So we break the town into basically 12 books. They're geographic. Book one would be the Martins Pond area. Book 12 would be the Greens. Book 13 is just the uh, commercial accounts which are scattered throughout towns. Again, we have 4,853 meters to November 30th. We had installed about 88.4% of those with new meters. Um, how we're doing it, there were three sets of mailings, three postcards that went out, notice one, two, and three. Um, those have all been mailed to every section in town. Uh, there were actually some door hangers or some uh, on-call that they tried to, to just make uh, unscheduled appointments as they were in town. They were required to actually do three door knocks at each property to try to get um, meters replaced. And then the last thing we've been doing is those that have not responded, we've sent certified mailings to a portion of them. We're actually looking to, just after the first of the year, go and uh, do certified mailings to anyone that hasn't received those as yet. Um, that 93.5% down at the bottom, that's the response rate for those that have received the certified mailing. So overall, we're at about 88%. We expect to get at least another 5 or 6% uh, on, on, the, on the overall project from that, uh, that last set of certified mailings we're going to do. Again, how has this progressed? Um, May and April, we basically contacted a number of people, mostly town hall employees, asked them to take part in our pilot program and went out and threw about 25 meters in just to test the program. Uh, May, June, and July they ramped up and began installing about a little over 400 meters a month. August, September, and October you can see the, the, the kind of the big increases there. Um, now we're getting to the point where we're at the kind of 90 percent are in and it's really starting to tail off. They've actually had weeks where they they haven't scheduled appointments here and they've gone from in October, they had five installers in town pretty much full time. They're down to one installer in town on kind of a every other week basis at this point. Um, 
just to give you a quick update, what are the issues we've run into with the project? Um, I'm going to, this is kind of a scary looking piece of pipe. Um, iron service line issues. So iron services in North Reading date back to pre-1960. In 1960 we began using copper, but I don't know if you can see this. This was a three quarter inch pipe. You can see it's down to about a quarter of an inch of uh, actual flow area inside the pipe. What happens is the iron actually dissolves itself and then tuberculates. It's almost like I always call it hardening of the arteries. It, it chokes itself off inside. Um, again, we've replaced about 4,200 meters. We broke one iron service pipe, and this is the one. Um, so iron service pipes, we're basically telling people, look, we're not going to touch the iron service pipe. We come in and break a pipe in your home, we're kind of responsible for that, even though it's, it's your pipe. Um, so we will be, uh, I'll explain a little how we're going to deal with that. Um, other things that we've had are uh, leaking, leaks on the lines. We don't want to touch lines with leaks on because then again, people will tell us we caused the leak. So if we come in and see the lines dripping or, or a little bit wet, we're not going to, uh, to touch that. Um, access issues, confined spaces, meters that have, you know, they've since built walls in front of the meter. It's behind your furnace. You, it's behind an oil tank. Things we just can't, simply can't get at. Um, there's some non-standard installations. Uh, scheduling issues, um, customers that need special times, um, customers that have scheduled and then are not home when we come to, to show up, uh, people just with you know, sicknesses or other personal issues that we're, we're trying to work around. And again, what we're trying to do is you know, we're literally trying to get in every single property in town. So you can imagine there's a few issues with those. Um, surprising number of vacant and bank home homes in town. Um, there's one home, uh, one street, just a little ways away from here that actually has three houses in a row that are either vacant or, or in, they're in some stage of the demo process. So a lot of houses in, uh, a lot of the smaller lots in North Reading sell, people tear the house down and look to build another house. Um, town issues, the water needs to be shut off at the street. We've been working with the contractor to do that as quick as we can. Um, it's just some of those we need to go back and revisit. The number one issue we've had is non-responsive customers. The three mailings, the three door knocks, and the certified mailing, and we still have people that are not letting us come in to change the, uh, the meters. Um, again, just kind of here's a, a bad situation. Um, if I can get this on. But what you see coming out of the ground there is an iron pipe. It looks very rusted. There's actually a coupling right where it comes out of the, the, the cement in the floor. You can see how rough the, the pipe is as it comes up out of the floor. An old gate valve, you can see the corrosion on the old gate valve. That indicates there probably was a leak there at one time. If we touch that and close that, it's probably going to leak. It may break in the closed position. If we open it back up, it may continue to leak. Something like that is something we don't want to touch because the iron pipe, the broken closed gate, gate valve, or the leaking gate valve, customers will come back and, and you know, look to the town. Um, so we're going to, I'll explain in a second how we're going to try to deal with those. But. So where are we again? Uh, we're in December of 2018. USI is continuing to uh, make appointments and continue to install water meters. Um, so what we're looking to do beginning fairly soon is actually as a condition of doing final water bills, if we see that you have an old meter in the house, we're going to basically require that you let us come in and replace the water meter as a condition of uh, doing that final water bill. Um, again, we're going to do that last group of certified letters to people who have not received a mailing in the past. Um, we will be sending a letter to people with those iron service lines that we're not looking to touch. Um, we're basically telling them they have a, 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 you know, a point to make repairs or make changes to that of November 15th. Um, through January, we'll continue to schedule regular appointments. Um, at some point in January or February, the contractor is basically going to have met most of their requirements. So they've got to do those, you know, those six notifications plus that certified uh, notice. At some point, they're going to be done with all that, and we're going to be left with a, a pool of meters that have not been uh, installed. Um, what we would be recommending, we talked about this back when we set the rates, is in February basically to start issuing bills that include that special meter reading fee if we haven't changed your meter out. Um, there probably will be some pushback on that, but again, that's what we said we want to do, and we're at the point where we know who has What's that rate again? Uh, it was $50. Now, 
the question was what was the period of the fifty dollars so i think some had suggested it be fifty dollars per week or fifty dollars per quarter um, i thought it was per reading per reading yeah. per reading but How is that every day read? is that every quarter so i think we discussed <coughs> weekly didn't we? i don't know maybe i can't remember it's been so long and, and then uh, you know through february march they will continue to work on doing punch list type items uh, and continue to do the appointments I do want to emphasize this. There is a number you can call. If you haven't done your, had your meter installed, you want to avoid that charge, there's a number right there, 888-709-9944. They're still scheduling appointments, and they'd be happy to talk to you. And I just really wanted to go quickly through this. So one of the great benefits to the homeowner of this project is the ability to track your own water usage. Um, is a, uh, and this website is live now. You can actually go there and log into this. It'll be looking for your account number and your customer ID, which you can find on your water bill. It'll ask for your zip code, and then you can log into this. I was going to do a live demo, but I've actually just captured some, some screenshots for this. But it's a, it's a great thing. Um, I'm going to try and explain why it's a great thing. Uh, so this is actually town hall. This is kind of the level of detail you can get on what's coming back to us for data. You can look at every year, every two months, every two weeks, every week, or every day in terms of what the water usage is. And what you're seeing here for town hall is you're seeing the last week of water use. Um, basically, Sunday, December 9th, not a lot of water use in town hall. That's what you'd expect. We're closed on Sunday. And then in Monday morning, you see no use, but then you see it ramp up as in the early morning back down, same thing Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So it's showing you actually um, each hourly water use here. And then again on Saturday, we have no water use, which is kind of a good thing. That's what you would expect to see um, for a building like this. You can actually drill down. So that prior screen was the weekly look at Town Hall. This is a daily look, and it's last December, or last Thursday, December 13th. It shows you every hour of the day um, where you, you know, you can point and click and drag this little balloon, it's showing you that from one to two in the morning, zero gallons pass through the meter at Town Hall. That's a good thing. You don't want water passing through your meter at two o'clock in the morning. What this is showing you, so orange is a possible leak. This is a different building, but what it's showing you is in the middle of the night, there is you know, about a gallon a minute passing through and it's consistent all night long. And if you go to the next night, there's still a gallon a minute. So there's some kind of leak going through that water meter. Um, this is set up so that you, it can actually notify you. If you sign into this, you can get notified that, hey, we think there's a leak on your property. And based on the volume of the leak, we think it might be a leaky toilet. You might want to take these steps to try to look at that. So before you get the high bill, uh, it's kind of a good thing. Here's a, here's a classic one. What you see is about 50 gallons an hour passing through this meter all the way up until sometime on November 7th. Uh, this gentleman came in and talked to me, didn't know why his water bill was high, and we backed into this and looked at it, and he, I asked him, did you do something on November 7th? And he said, uh, yeah, that was about the time I went and shut the valve to my sprinkler system off. His sprinkler system wasn't running, but he had a leak somewhere outside his house on his sprinkler system that was leaking at about 50 gallons an hour, which is a lot of water. And uh, you know, he shut that off, and there it shows. If you see right there in the middle of the graph, you know, his usage dropped way off once he shut that valve. A lot of good information can come out of it. Again, this is the same leak just showing you on it, you know, that day where he shut it off. It's over, this is this line right here is 50 gallons an hour. So he's at or above 50 gallons an hour until he shuts that valve outside. First question we always ask when people call to complain about their water bills is, do you irrigate your lawn? Two responses we always get are, I don't have a swimming pool, and the town has a water ban on. That's not the question. The question, did you water your lawn? You can go back to this and look at this. This is, if you look at the right hand or the left hand side, that's how many gallons per day are passing through this guy's meter. Those spikes are over 3,000 gallons a day. If you look at that, it's Monday, July 2nd, Tuesday, very little use, then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Skip Saturday and Sunday. Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. He's got his sprinkler system coming on and watering 3,000 gallons a day, four days a week. 
not in compliance with our watering schedule, but that's why his water bill is so high. If you look at his low points, they're 200 gallons a day, so he's taking 15 times his average daily use and dumping it on his lawn four times a week. We've, again, we've had this discussion with a bunch of people who come in and they're yelling about their water bill until we show them this. And you know, the classic response that I love is the, a woman came in and she said, oh, I should probably stop yelling at you and go home and yell at my husband instead. And I said, yep, thank you very much. <coughs> again, just drilling into the hourly use for that same thing. You could see at 4 o'clock in the morning, the sprinkler system comes on and it uses 500 gallons an hour for the next five hours. And no matter which day of those high peak days I look at, that pattern is right there. That's classic indication that they're just using their sprinkler over and over again. What this can do is, if again, you can sign in and if your bill is going to be high, a projection bill is going to be high, it can notify you. You can actually go in here and see your data. Again, what we had with the old system was on, on May 1st, we knew what your meter reading read. On August 1st, we knew what your meter reading read. We could ask you, we could say, it looks like you're watering your grass, but this, you know, this is telling us pretty clearly what's going on, and it can tell the homeowner. It's just so much uh, better at, uh, at answering those types of questions. So this is something I'm very excited about, and uh, I just very much would encourage people to go and explore it a little bit. It does have uh, recommendations. It'll take a look at your use, and it'll, you know, it can't tell exactly how you're using the water, but it can, you know, it can give you some good recommendations. Very good at promoting the, uh, the water conservation. Again, as you guys remember, we, uh, we've had water bans over the years. We go out, we drive the town at 3 or 4 in the morning to try to see who's watering their grass. We don't have to do that anymore. I mean, we've got very clear evidence of what's going on Can here. you put that website back up again? Sure. Uh, it, it's not on our town website, the link to it. Uh, there so, will be shortly. Okay. Yes, Mr. Kim. So I, I believe it, the, the, the uh, interface just became active recently, Mark. I don't know it's only been within about the last seven days that it's been active. Uh, I, will, I will say this as kind of a caveat. I know there's at least one gentleman in town that's been on it every single day trying to drill into it. And there is a delay between your meter getting installed and the data being available on the website. And it can be up to six weeks. So I know because we could, you could go in and see who's logging in and trying to see the data. And uh, I don't want people to be discouraged. It is there and, you know, for the majority of the town, probably 3,000 plus of the accounts, the data is there live and, and it is coming for others. Uh, again, if you haven't changed your meter, this can, this can help you not have huge water bills in the future. I'm just going to say this because Warren was here and Warren left. Warren came in last week and he's like, you know, I did a Title V inspection on this house. The house is vacant. But the system's flooded. I don't know what's going on. We called up the account for it, and you could see the house is vacant. There's no usage. But at one point, about three weeks before he did his Title V inspection, someone must have come and flushed the toilet, and the flapper valve didn't see. Because all of a sudden, he's got 600 gallons a day from an empty house going into his septic system. Someone came in about a day before Warren went out there, and that sealed itself. But it had been flooded for three weeks with 700 gallons a day of water. And, you know, Warren basically was going to have to recommend you need a new system because there's something wrong with your system. But, no, it wasn't that. There was a leak that was just flooding out the end. Uh, Mark, would it be possible to put that website on the bill? Yeah, yep, we can do that. Educate people, hey, check this out. Yep. This is great. This is very good. Yeah. Yeah. So, I think I would like to get an update as we get into the first quarter of next year or into the first quarter of next year where we are with people getting getting these completed and we just need to get more awareness and I don't know what we do but at some point revisit the fine structure I think that's something because this is it's very labor intensive people don't have an appreciation for if we have a small few that are going to cause us to have a lot more manual for them it's, it's going to be expensive for them and if you can imagine, it's not a matter of walking down the street and we have to read every one of these houses. No, we have to know which houses we have to hit and which yeah. houses we have to skip. Yeah. So it's a matter of, you know, the meter reader has to look at a list and make sure he catches those houses that don't well, have the new meter. You know, the whole system is evolving and you have to apply your resources to where the work is now and it's changing. And then what do we do with those meters? If you reassign other people to do these more technology things, we don't have those resources available to be walking around. So that's a labor-intensive 
project we have to our person we have to keep available and you know I know this probably some people out there just say I don't care I'm never changing my meter well we may have a few of those but there's got to be a way for us to recoup our cost because we made this significant investment please keep us up to date but thank you sure this is good good summary any questions for Mark before we go into the water project Mark is uh, finishing up, and then Pat, are you gonna you you're going next? Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. So I just wanted to give you an update uh, and schedule on the ongoing water project, uh, what I call the connection to Andover project. You recall, I have Rob Williamson here from Wright Pierce. He's our consultant uh, in this effort, and he was kind enough to put together this critical path uh, schedule for us, and I, I sort of broke that out into uh, non-engineering language for us in the next few slides. You see Rob started here with uh, the execution of the 99-year um, IMA with Andover. So we agreed with Andover that we were going to um, buy water from them for the next 99 years. Um, you recall the original effort was to pursue a source of water from the south, and we decided to change that. So we, were, we had to um, file a notice of project change. We recently filed that. Let me see if I can get to the next slide. So we filed the notice of project change in October. The, um, the official filing date or submission date for that was in November. Uh, there's a 20, 20 day period for a comment on that. Um, so we can still receive comments until December 28th, just based on the math, that's the final date. Uh, with those com comments, we can incorporate those and submit our final FEIR uh, in May and hopefully get our final FEIR certificate in June of 2019. Uh, we'll have our inter-basin transfer agreement, uh, public hearings in July, and from July to September of 2019, and hopefully uh, an inter-basin transfer agreement certificate in March of 2020. Can you explain the IBTA? What, where's that held? What's the need for it? Is there any risk with those hearings? So, uh, well, it's a, it's a MEPA process, though so it's through the Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act Office. And basically what it, it serves to do is it, it, it tries to account for what is used within a certain watershed. So we're, we're taking water from a watershed and distributing it into another watershed. So essentially we're taking water from the, the where Andor was getting their water from, a, a separate watershed, and where through our septic systems, and other sources we're distributing into a different uh, into a different watershed. So they try to have what they're trying to do and what they're trying to ensure is that there's there's a balance in, in each watershed. So when you're doing that you need to you need to provide these reports which consider all of the different possibilities, all of your different options, and they want to make sure that you've done your due diligence and that this is the best option. So you'll have to do some, um, some interbasin sort of calculations on where the water's going and how that's done. And again, Rob can speak to the, to the depths of what the, what, the, um, what the risks are and what those hearings may, um, may present to us if, we, if we're not having success. I don't know, Rob, if you have any input on that. Yeah, um, hmm. yeah for th this process, there's probably not a lot of risk. Um, the IBTA process actually starts with the filing of the FEIR. They consider that their application. So as the FEIR is being reviewed by MEPA, the IBTA people are also reviewing the FEIR for its applicability to the interbasin transfer permit. So once you get your, your final, the final FEIR certificate, 
um, I, I don't want to say it's um, it's like clockwork, but it's just a process that they have to go through and allow people to comment. We shouldn't have a problem here because we're taking from a, a donor basin that's rich in water and we're putting it into a basin for, that we're in the Ipswich Basin that's poor. So um, I don't see that there'll be a lot of risk here. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Masseri. Just, just to comment, Mike, currently we have an interbasin transfer yep. from Andover to North Reading of about 1.55 million gallons per day. So this is related to increasing it to up to between 2.7 and 3 million gallons a day. Yep. I was familiar with that. I was just more concerned about the public hearings and, you know, it was going to be a painstaking process since it's, nothing's going to be non-painstaking all the way up till now. So that's good. I'm glad it's just more of a... Uh, it's going to be time-consuming, but not too risky. And are they held here? One, there's one held in this basin, so it'll probably be held here, and then there'll be one held in another basin, presumably in Andover. In Andover. Okay. And, and you hope that... So through the F FEIR process, we have public hearings on this whole project. You hope that all the big issues have already been flushed out before you get to the public hearing process for the IPTA. Thank you. So I just want to talk a little bit about the design and construction uh, portion of this as it relates to the chlorination facilities. We're going to need there's two connections, interconnections with Andover. Um, one's on Central Street and one's on Main Street. There's a town owned, so there's going to be two new chlorination systems um, that upgrade or um, increase the chlorination available in the water as it crosses from Andover. The town owns a piece of property on Central Street that will be the first location, and we're currently pursuing an additional location on Main Street. We've been in discussions with um, a couple of different property owners there and those are ongoing and, and promising and positive. Uh, we're hoping to have those um, secured or at least have a reasonable agreement, agreement in January or February of uh, next year. With that we'll be able to pursue survey geotechnical preliminary design uh, immediately after that. Hopefully have fi uh, final design on, on, those, on those locations in May. We'll submit those designs for comment and approval to Mass DOP, uh, Mass DEP shortly thereafter. Hopefully, receive final approval from DEP in July of 2019. Uh, go out to bid the following spring for construction, um, leading that, leading for uh, starting in that summer and proceeding through the fall and winter into the next spring. Yeah, add to a little bit. Actually. Some of the work on uh, the sites has already begun. Um, so we've already done wetland flagging. That happened a couple weeks ago. Um, once we knew that the, this second site looks like it was going to be a go. Um, tomorrow, there's a driller moving into each site. Um, they're starting at Central Street. We're doing one geotechnical bore into each site that's needed for the design of the buildings. So we'll do Central Street tomorrow and probably move to the other property um, on, what will that be, Wednesday, Wednesday or Thursday. And then survey, um, they were going to start survey before Christmas, but we added some more scope. So they're going to do survey um, January 2nd, 3rd, and possibly the 4th. Um, so they'll pick up the two sites, and then they're picking up more wetland flagging for some water main projects uh, that Pat's going to talk about in a second here as well. Thank you. <coughs> So Rob mentioned we're, we're also part of, portion of this project involves the upgrade or re, um, replacement of some water mains in town um, down Main Street and North, and North Street. So the first step in that process is to submit a road opening, a street opening permit with Mass DOT. Uh, we have to do some borings to understand what's uh, what's in the roadways that we plan to put the water main in. That'll help us put together a, a uh, comprehensive bid and understand what the costs are going to be associated with that project. So we're hoping to have those done uh, in the spring. With the uh, final design of those projects in July, we'll submit the final design to DEP, hopefully receive approval from them um, in the fall, and begin bidding and construction soon thereafter for completion in 2020. And then there was one last thing we want to talk about. Recently there's been um, 
you may have seen some newspaper articles and some discussion about um, sewer overflows that end up in the in the Merrimack River. That's always obviously a, a concern for some people is that's going to be a source of water for us. Uh, so in an effort to, to give a level of comfort for the folks that are getting that water, we wanted to uh, just talk about the water treatment processes that are in place in Andover. And uh, I'm going to defer to Rob to that. Let's get a little bit more understanding of how that works. So real quick. Um, I just put a little flow chart together just kind of to show everyone um, where the water originates from and how Andover <coughs> treats it and, and how it's protected and um, treated and very safe by the time it arrives in North, North Reading. So um, Andover gets their water from actually from Haggett's Pond. It's a pond right next to where the treatment plant is. Um, and Haggett's Pond does not have the, uh, the sufficient volume to supply the community throughout the whole year. So they supplement Haggett's Pond with two other sources, one being Fish Brook and one being the Merrimack River. Um, they have a pumping station that pumps from both and um, pumps into Haggett's Pond. So um, in terms of treatment, one of the first steps that happens is um, all the water that does come from the Merrimack or, or Fish Brook um, there's a natural setting, settling process that happens in the pond itself. So all water has some sediment in it of some kind. Um, because the pond is so large and, and it's detention time, the lot that, and that's the time a drop of water sits in the pond before it's actually treated, um, it's quite long. Uh, it's a long period of time before a drop of water moves through there. There's natural settling of any sediments that are in the water. But once they pull the water, so they pump the water from Haggett's Pond into the treatment plant, and there's a number of um, steps that it goes through to purify it. The first thing they do is they use ozonation, ozone, um, and that acts to oxidize um, particles that are in, in the water, it kind of puts them in a, um, a stable state that they can be handled better. Um, with other treatment process, and they also add chlorine um, for disinfection. And you're going to see the word chlorine come up a number of times. Um, the second step that once the water goes through the ozonation process, then they add all the chemicals for all the different things that they're trying to do to the water. They add a coagulant. Um, what, what that is is a, a chemical that makes bigger particles in the water that's heavier than those particles and that those particles settle out in that third step sedimentation. So these coagulants are essentially taking any particles that are floating in the water, um, traps them, and then they settle out in the bottom of the basin and are removed from the water. Uh, they also add more chemicals for another oxidation process, and they um, can read this, and then they add more chlorine as well, so they're doing disinfection again. I mentioned the, the settling process, the sedimentation process, where um, the majority of the particulates are taken out of the water. After it flows through the sedimentation process, it goes through a filtration process. This is another barrier. Um, so any remaining very fine particles are removed through the um, filtration process. Um, and then once it goes through filtration, that's called the finished water. Um, it's essentially uh, suitable for drinking at that point. They add some chemicals just to uh, treat the water for um, pH and things like that, but they also add chlorine again. So it's the third step in the bacteria process. Um, so this, this is considered a very, very robust process. Um, and the finished product you're left with is very high quality water. Um, they have to meet them as well as anyone who provides drinking water to the public has to meet all sorts of um, both federal and state regulations. Uh, in terms of supplying water to the public, um, so you get, you end up with a very high quality product. Through you, Mr. Chairman, I think there's a great uh, description of how the uh, the system is set up, uh, delivering water from the Merrimack River, uh, ultimately here to North Reading. I just want to ask the water superintendent to kind of speak to the things that we learned over the past six or eight months about how Andover actually operates that system, because I think that's also important. Sure. As Rob <coughs> mentioned, um, Haggett's Pond has a drainage area. It's not sufficient to supply the, the town forever, but they can subsist off the pond for an extended period of time. So if there is an issue on the Merrimack River, the upstream of Andover where they take in, communities upstream notify communities downstream if they have a discharge event. 
and Andover has the ability to then shut off that intake. They don't have to take water 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Uh, if you think about what's causing these uh, overflow events, it's generally high flow periods. Uh, high flow periods in the river are also periods where the pond is kind of recharging itself more too because you're getting heavy rain there so that tends to bring the pond up lessening the need to draw from the river so if they are notified that they have an event upstream that might trigger uh, some water quality issues coming to them they have a vested interest in protecting their pond so they'll shut off that intake for that time um, the other thing and Rob touched on this a bit but I just want to talk about what's coming out of that plant is very high quality water and it's tested daily uh, I know there's some reports out there that, that you know seem to suggest people are getting sick after these sewage events um, I don't see any way that the drinking water can be causing that that level of illness so we test for what's called total coliform bacteria in the drinking water total coliform is not something that'll make you sick it's an indicator bacteria uh, it's used before looking for fecal bacteria with the the, the thought process, if there's no total coliform in the water, there can't be any fecal coliform in the water. So before there can be a, a, you know, a high contamination issue, you would see something in the drinking water. Andover is very, very good about testing their drinking water and making sure that, that it meets all standards. If there, you know, if there was any indication, again, they don't draw direct from the Merrimack River, but even the communities that do, none of them are having issues with the water coming out of their treatment plants. If there was, the state DEP would be jumping all over, all over uh, the, the water treatment people. Um, so we've been drinking Andover water since at least the 1950s. Um, it, is, it is recognized as one of the highest quality waters in the state. Um, I, I'm personally very confident in it. I drink it every day that I'm here. So. Mr. Missouri. He answered the question. He answered the question. the point. You Thank you. Point, right. <laughs> Please continue. Uh, that's basically all I had. So, so do Thank we have a chart like this that basically after the chemical addition there, the town line, and then what happens to the water once it enters the water town line? So basically water we're taking from Andover right now, is, uh, on Main Street we don't have the ability to rechlorinate that water. That's one of the reasons we're looking for a piece of property to, to add an additional uh, chlorination facility. We're not looking to add it because the water coming in from Andover doesn't meet drinking water standards. What we have to do as North Reading is all the way out at the far end of our system, which would be out, say, by the Thompson Country Club, as far removed as from our Andover sources are, we have to meet federal and state drinking water requirements out there. So in the summertime, when the temperature's up, the water temperature's up, the chlorine levels at the end of our system would be zero. So we're looking to basically add uh, just that additional uh, chlorine dose at the two, two interconnections at the town lines in order to just further safeguard. So most, almost every community adds chlorine or chloramines to their, which is a combination of chlorine and ammonia to their drinking water. It's basically to prevent against any type of microbial growth out in your, your distribution system. And that's what we would be looking to do. It would provide another level of, uh, of safety to the drinking water. Um, but the water and or supplying us now is, is uh, you know, bacteria free. It's, it's clean, good drinking water at this point. So. Thank you. Anything else? So it looks like we're, we're on pace. Uh, Mr. Masseri and Mr. O'Leary is updated, continue to keep us updated on the location, potential location for this chlorination facility, which I think is great. I'm glad we been able to identify it sounds like it's on a positive path which fits in line with your timeline that you presented tonight so when um, you get to that point in your timeline you've identified a location did you say you were going to go out to these locations and do borings to make sure the facility can <coughs> we've already been allowed <coughs> preliminarily by the owners of the property to go out and start doing borings already great so so we'll wait. have all the full knowledge if you know the property is suitable for what we yeah. want to do exactly because we need as part of the FEIR process we have to provide almost a full design for all the uh, different aspects of the project mm -hmm. so we need to have these at least for the for the stations we have to have at least the site design done 
to submit with the FAIR yep. um, so they can evaluate what, if there are any environmental impacts as a result of the project. So I, my last question for the evening goes along with, you know, we've changed course, went down this road, we've changed budgets because we've changed course. Are we going to stay within budget? Do you foresee any issue with our budget that we have uh, appropriated for town meeting to complete the entire process? Um, I would say we're still working just on draft budgets right now. Um, we're still in the very early stages of understanding what all the aspects of the project are. Um, so we just started talking about that last week, um, where we are, so I don't have a firm answer for you. I know we're refining that. Do you foresee that we may have to go back to town meeting? We're hoping not. Uh, we hope not, exactly. Exactly. Not. And right now, it's so preliminary, you know, his cost estimates to date have been extremely conservative. So it might be bumping up to the budget that we have. Uh, and we're hoping that as things get refined, those conservative estimates then become more realistic and come down. That's where you want us to be at this point. We don't know enough about them to be That's pre That's precise. Fine. Yep. And as they move through design, then we're going to be able to know with a little more precision, um, you know, what their cost will be. And the numbers, like Steve said, um, should, and they almost always do, start coming down. I, and I had an idea what you were going to say and how you were going to answer it, yep. but I think it's also important for us to transparent, full transparency to Absolutely. the public as we go through this process. Yep. You know, money is always the question. Yep. Right? Well, you can be assured that Mr. Masseri and I have already been probing. <laughs> they have been probing. <laughs> Thank you. That is true. But without knowing where this second site was going to be, yep. we just didn't have enough information to, to provide full, you know, Decent estimates no at this point. Believe me, that's why I asked the question. Yep. Understanding, and I wouldn't have been shocked if you came back and said, no, we, we may have a significant issue and we may have to come back to the drawing board. I'm okay with it as long as we're identifying, communicating it, and we can explain it. But we're certainly far away less than where we would if we went the other direction. Yes. So I'm okay. I just want to make sure we're transparent. That's Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and what's 10 or 11 million bucks? <laughs> um, any other board members' questions? Thank you again. I apologize for the late getting okay. up to the podium, but this was worth it. I think it's important for the community. I look forward to reading all about it in the transcript in excruciating detail. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Uh, let's see. All right. Board members, we're going to go back to the minutes, we are, are we? and then we're going to get back right in track with our agenda and what we have left to do. And if um, anyone's stepping out, I want to just wish you all a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and if you could turn the light on the way out. Instead of something. turning them off, turn them on. Hit the switch. Hit the switch. Yeah. Please. Thank you. Board members. The other way. <laughs> Board members, I know we've been here long. Do we want to take a five minute break? No? Let's get done. Steve, you're good? You're the other one's doing a lot of the reading, so let's rock and roll. We, we're okay. We can, we can continue. Yeah. Minutes, November 29, 2018, regular and executive session. Mr. O'Leary. Okay. November 18th, we have or 29th? I'm sorry, November 28th, um, 29th. Okay. Sorry. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve Tied. the November 29, 2018 regular session minutes as written. Second. Motion is second. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? No. Aye. Opposed? 401. Executive session for November 29. Chairman, I move to approve the November 29th, 2018 executive session minutes as written. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. Mignopelli. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 401. Four. December 3rd, regular session. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the December 3rd regular session minutes as written. Second. Motion and a second. By Mr. Mignopelli, any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 401. Executive session. 
believe we we'll, believe we'll pass it. Yeah, believe the board wanted to pass over that. Take executive that's session. Okay. At least so I was told. Yeah. Isn't that the one you emailed? Did you get some other comments? Some comments. Oh, there was. You got some other comments? Yeah. Oh, right. so we'll wait. Let's wait. December 11th, 2018, regular session. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the December 11th, 2018, regular session minutes as written. Second. I have a motion to second. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Okay. License renewals. Mr. Chairman Thierry, I believe we have a motion authorizing the chair to sign a uh, grant letter um, that's uh, been added to the packet and to the agenda. Um, <clears throat> Mr. O'Leary, I think, has it. It's uh, yeah. the agenda item before the license renewals. Yep. <coughs> so, uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to authorize the chair, uh, the chairman, to sign a letter of support for a grant application sponsored by Winchester Hospital for Youth Alcohol Prevention. Second. I have a motion and a second. Very brief description, Mr. Chairman. So that's uh, a grant application that's been brought to our attention by Amy Luckowitz, who is the uh, Youth Substance Abuse Coordinator, um, as well as uh, facilitator for the Community Impact Team. And they're intending to, sue, uh, to apply for the grant and re are requesting a letter of support from the board. Great. That's fantastic. <coughs> Thank you. So any other comments, questions? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Now we'll go to license renewals, please. It seems like it gets bigger every year. <laughs> it's a good thing. It's a good sign. Yes, it is. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I move to renew the following common vigilant licenses to expire December 31st, 2019, subject to our regulatory department requirements. <clears throat> Excuse me. Dairy Queen, Dos Lobos, Ginger Gourmet, Group One Entertainment, LLC, Hillview Country Club. Heavenly Donuts, Horseshoe Cafe, Inc., Joe Fish Restaurant, Kitty's Restaurant, Mario's Restaurant, Nan's Center Cafe, North Reading Christopher Club, Raya's Store, Sports, Spirits, and Steaks, The Hornet's Nest, Teresa's Prime Grill 19, The Asa LLC, DBA Subway, and Wendy's. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Not heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Mr. Chairman, I move to, remove, to renew the following common vigilant wine and malt beverage license to expire December 31st, 2019, subject to all regulatory department requirements. Mario's Restaurant Day. Second. A motion is second. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Chairman, I move to renew the uh, following common vigilant. All alcohol licenses to expire December 31st, 2019, subject to all regulatory department requirements. Dos Lobos, Ginger Gourmet, Group One Entertainment, LLC, Hillview Country Club, Horseshoe Cafe, Inc., Joe Fish Restaurant, Kitty's Restaurant, Sports, Spirits, and Steaks, Teresa's Prime Grill, 19. Second. Motion is second by Mrs. Minupelli. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Just that side and send it down. <coughs> send it back. Just two. Fraternal Club. Mr. Chairman, I move to renew the following Fraternal Club licenses to expire December 31st, 2019, subject to all regulatory department requirements. Loyal Order of Moose, North Reading Christopher Club. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Minupelli. Any discussion? Just curious, what is the Christopher Club? Knights Columbus. Oh. Look a long moment there. <laughs> Any more questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Package store all alcohol Mr. Lights. Chairman, I move to renew the following package store all alcohol licenses to expire December 31st, 2019, subject to all regulatory department requirements. 
Eastgate Liquors, New England Beverage and Redemption, One Stop Liquors. Second. A motion and second. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Package store wine and malt beverage licenses to expire December 31st, 2019, subject to all regulatory, regulatory department requirements. Christopher's Market, Convenience Plus, Route 28 Lucky Mart, Ryer Store, Speedway. Second. I have a motion to second. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Following motions on class one and class two licenses. Uh, again, for the record, to show that I will not be participating in the discussion as I have a family member who holds a, who holds a class two license. Therefore, I will not be participating in the discussion or voting. I'll be abstaining. Uh, class one license, Mr. Chairman, I move to renew the following class one licenses to expire January 1, 2020, subject to all regulatory department requirements Bobcat of Boston, uh, Melconi and Subaru, and North Reading Motorsports. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And one abstention. Abstain. So 4 0 1. Noted. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the next motion deals with Route 28 Motors, who is a past client of mine, so, and I have to recuse myself from this, so I'm going to pass that to Ms. Manny <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I move to renew the following Class II licenses to expire January 1st, 2020, subject to all regulatory department requirements. NECA, Inc., DBA, Route yeah. 28, Motors. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Masseri? Second. Second by Mr. Masseri. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Three, two, three zero two. Noted. <coughs> livery license. Mr. Chairman, I move to renew the following livery license to expire December 31st, 2018, subject to all regulatory department requirements, Metro Town Car. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Masseri. Any discussion? None heard. Of, oh, wait a minute. There's a discussion. Why is it expired? That's what, I, that's what I read because it said 80, but it's 19. Thank you. So, Mr. Chairman, once again, I move to renew the following livery license to expire December 31st, 2019, subject to all regulatory department requirements, Metro Town Car. Mr. Masseri seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Mr. Chairman, I move to renew the following jukebox license. By December 31st, 2019, subject to our regulatory department requirements. Loyal order of the Moose. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Sunday entertainment licenses to expire December 31st, 2019, subject to all regulatory department requirements. Group One Entertainment LLC, W Country Club. Sports, Spirits, and Steaks. Teresa Prime, Grill 19. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Unheard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous.
all set. Just to check. Yeah, I move that the following license be held That's in the set. office of the town administrator until the license has met, all, met satisfactory compliance of all issues with the building department. The lobster club. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Oh, second. Just like what we're in. So Just looking for that motion. Yeah, no. <laughs> so, uh, does this mean we're just uh, are we voting in favor of this and just holding it? Mr. Chairman, through you. Yes. So the, the intention here would be to ask the board to uh, vote in favor of the renewal, uh, with the uh, instructions included that the license be held in uh, uh, the office of the town administrator until compliance with the uh, building department uh, items occurs. <coughs> and the, the items are relative to, uh, I think, what has been a partial uh, renovation and improvements to it. I can read from a report um, from the building inspector, but basically there's some work going on there um, that uh, is either incomplete, some of which they need to obtain permitting for, um, um, that's important enough that the building department was concerned with regard to the renewal. We're optimistic that between now and December 31st that those issues will be addressed and that we'll be able to release the license for renewal um, at that point. If we what get to license are we talking about though? Let's specifically say which license we're holding. Yeah, that, so their, their, their only license I believe they have is a common vigilor oh, license from us. Yeah. So so yeah, sure. We certainly don't want them to be closed. So is there, we'll do it this way, but if we get to that point, um, we're going to have to bring this back up. I, I think the way that it's currently written, I think we're going to put off a lot of attention. And if the, if the so building I moved to, I knew, moved to renew the common vigilant license. Pending. Correct. Was that? So, so the the the, the, bo renew the okay. board has already okay. renewed so it because it, renew it. And, and the application was complete at that point in time, but this issue remains okay. unresolved. So we okay. Yes. Uh, so we already voted it. Right. At, a at a previous meeting, you voted it. So okay. that's okay. why it's not here tonight. All right. So the motion stands, Mr. Chairman, that we just hold the license until it's in compliance. Okay. That's fair. Thank but, you. But what happens if they don't complete what they're supposed to? By the they get shut down January first. That's so that would be the intention. Again, okay, we're hopeful that that, that that won't be the case, and um, that they don't. I, I don't want to represent here that there needs to be, you know, 100% compliance. You know, with a, some level of reason, obviously coming from the building department, but there was concern enough that these issues aren't addressed. Sure. That they shouldn't be renewed. Well, again, we don't meet till January 14th. Right. So my thought would be, would it be fair, or are you going to recommend against this, that we change it to uh, January 14th? Revisit it then because I hate to see them close down. But if it's a significant issue or a major issue, then we'll just leave it as it is. But I don't want to see them close unless you know. yes, he's, he's in control of that, though. Well, it sounds like this construction is it a construction? there's some construction going on, and some of it is related to the, the, um, the building systems, and some of it's related to the exterior of the building as well. That there needs to be uh, work done to address, yeah. And, and I assume. They are working as hard as they can to get there. I only bring it up to the board. We don't meet again until the 14th. If it expires, it was always called years. So the license, um, the license will expire, obviously, but they've also already been renewed. They would effectively be operating without the license until it's issued. This is our, you know, our recommendation with regard to how to uh, handle this. Uh, we have in the past uh, renewed the license uh, to a further point in time after. December 31st, but we've also been advised by town council that it's not clear that there's any statutory authority for us to do that either. So that's where this we'll, kind of came we'll from. We'll leave it alone. Thank you. Um, again, I'm, I'm very optimistic that this will get resolved, and if it, if it becomes such a significant issue that it warrants board um, uh, and, uh, discussion, then we'll certainly contact you, Mr. Chairman, and okay. ask for a meeting. Well, yeah, I just. Thank you. I got it. Next, please, Mr. O'Leary. Sorry. No, we need to vote. Can we repeat that motion? Sorry. So the motion is, move that the following license be held in the office of the town administrator until the licensee has met satisfactory compliance with all issues with the building department. Yeah, and I Lost. seconded that. Okay. Second. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't hear it. 
All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Unanimous. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to renew the following automatic amusement device license to expire December 31st, 2019. Subject to all regulatory requirements. Cowabunga's Entertainment, Kitty's Restaurant, Loyal Order of the Moose, Sport, Spirits, and Steaks. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. What I'll do is I'll hold all the ones that are fully signed. Should be one group 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 just side. Steve. And, uh, yep. That way, they, if it's coming back to you, okay. just catch your, need your signature. And then I'll bring them all back to you once we're done. Reappointments uh, conservation commission, I believe. Is next. Correct, Mr. Chairman. I move to place a nomination of the following names for appointment as member of the conservation commission to fill an unexpired term through December 31st, 2019. One opening Melissa Campbell, Michael Boole, Randall Mason, John Layton, Lawrence Bashara, Thomas Sanchez, Beth Adams. Wow, second. I have, we have a motion and a second. Yes. Uh, a call has been answered. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, kid. As you know, we're uh, scrambling for uh, applicants to serve on the Conservation Commission, and we put out the call and got a tremendous response. We've had uh, seven people uh, respond, uh, willing to serve on the Conservation Commission. We've spoken with all of them, and. Uh, we invited them all to go to the last Conservation Commission meeting, which was last week. Uh, five of the seven were able to make it. It was on late notice, and uh, the other two that couldn't make it, which is a scheduling problem, that weren't able to make it. But all great candidates. Uh, on behalf of the board, I thank them very much for stepping forward and their willingness to, uh, to serve. Uh, my recommendation, and again, in consultation, we had the Conservation Commission interview the candidates, met with the candidates. In a consultation with us, members of the Conservation Commission and the chairperson, um, and a recommendation to the board is to appoint uh, Melissa Campbell at this particular time um, to fill the unexpired term. Melissa is uh, she's got a uh, bachelor's degree in uh, marine biology. I think that uh, her background and her expertise uh, would uh, dovetail well with the uh, current commission members and serve the commission well at this particular time. Um, the other thing that I will be asking the board to do is. To, uh, indicated to these people that now would be a good time to um, for us to appoint some associate members yes. as a feeder program. Uh, as we can anticipate over the next year or so, I would expect that we'll have some other vacancies. This is a good chance. And so it would be good if people uh, would be willing to serve as associate members and from the associates move up into the full membership. So what I would ask is that at the next meeting, uh, I'll probably be recommending maybe three associate members. 
because I've been in consultation with the uh, the chair, and some members of the conservation commission. They're all in agreement. <coughs> this to be a, when we have the interest, let's you know, seize on the moment and uh, groom some people to uh, to move into the, the full membership slot. So uh, we won't be voting on any uh, nominations for um, associate members this evening. We'll do it at our first meeting in January. That's great. So this evening, just have the one unexpired term, which was Mr. Romeo's. It expires December 31st. So Melissa Campbell is, uh, is the recommendation. Okay. So we have a call. motion. Do we have a second? I Mrs. already Mrs. seconded. You already second? Yeah. So it's a roll call vote. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Minipelli? Melissa Campbell. Mr. Schultz? Ms. Campbell. Mr. Massieri? Melissa Campbell. Mr. O'Leary? Melissa Campbell. And the chair votes Melissa Campbell. I want to again thank all the members or all the uh, volunteers for and stepping again, up I to our call. I encourage them to uh, to stay on stay on the hook here, and uh, hopefully most of them will stick and are willing to serve as uh, associate members. And for those that don't uh, get chosen, uh, we have a whole host of other committees and commissions that uh, yes. uh, need some people to serve, and it's it's wonderful. Again, the response was terrific. I greatly appreciate it. Great. Water commission. Nominate, place a nomination the following name for reappointment as a member of the Water Commission for a term to expire December 31st, 2021. There are two openings, but only one applicant at this particular time. Uh, Joseph Semino, he's the incumbent. Oh, second. I got a motion, I have a second. So we only had one applicant for two the, openings? The other incumbent uh, moved out of town. Wonder so any, we'll, any of the CPC applicants <coughs> may be a fit for this. Mm -hmm. We'll see. CPC. Or, I'm sorry, conservation. Oh, okay. Conservation. All right. Yeah. I got you. Yeah, that would be that would be great. Um, if somehow if we had any communication with them to see if any of them would be willing to use their expertise over on the water commission would be great. But we have a motion, we have a second. We only have one candidate for two openings, so we'll just go with that for now. It's a roll call vote. What was that name again? Mrs. Minipelli? Joseph? I can't find it. Semino. Semino. Oh, Joseph Semino. Semino. Oh, sorry. Semino. Semino. Mr. Schultz. Joseph Mr. Semino. Mr. Masseri. Joseph Semino. And Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Semino. And Joseph Semino. 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 Okay. And Mr. Chairman. I move to place a nomination. 14 now. Following names for reappointment appointment as members of the Commission on Disabilities for Terms to Expire, <coughs> expire December 31st, 2001. There are three openings, two applicants, both incumbents. Meg Robertson, Joseph Vino. So second. Have I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Now Steve, this you'll have to uh, inform me on how you got so many candidates. <laughs> we put the word out. Yeah, I guess we got to do that across the board. Yeah. Seven out. Seven out. We, we, we were specific to the Conservation Commission on that. Yeah. 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 So it, was, it was a lot of social media uh, awareness on that. Yeah, you, you would have to do that. So we have a motion. We have a second. Uh, is this a roll call vote as well? Yeah. Mrs. Minipelli. Which one? We're on Commission on Disabilities. Oh, okay. Robertson Meg and Robinson Vino. and Joseph Vino. Did we second? Mrs. Meg Robbins, Robertson and Joseph Vino. Mr. Schultz. Robertson and Vino. Mr. O'Leary. Robertson I mean, Vino. Mr. Masseri. Meg Robertson and Joseph Vino. And Unanimous. <laughs> and those of you who are still tuned in, if you have an interest. All three of you. Uh, all three of you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They fall asleep. They Mr. fall asleep in the chair. Mr. O'Leary, Mr. Masseri, Mr. And Mel. <laughs> historic, <laughs> historic commission. <laughs> Getting late. <laughs> We're almost there, guys. We're almost there. Historic commission. Right, Mr. Chairman, I move to place a nomination the following names for reappointment or appointment as members of the historic 
district commission for terms to expire December 31st, 2021. Three openings. Mabel DeFranza, an incumbent. Patrick O'Rook, incumbent. Will Burkmeyer, incumbent. And Peter Antonucci. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. Minipelli. Any discussion? Mr. Masseri? I spoke to the incumbents and they were all interested in being reappointed. Uh, I don't know if there's an associate member. Uh, there isn't, but it doesn't mean we can't. Right, so it's another one of those we got. Whenever we have a candidate that uh, there's not enough seats for, trying to get them to be an associate member just helps us out trying to keep all these yeah. committees uh, Filled, so. so maybe I think I, I'll be with Steve and try to see if we can't do something in our next meeting. That'd be great. Sure. Associates. But for this, I'll be recommending the three incumbents. Incumbents, really. Excuse okay. me. Okay. We have a motion. We have a second. Mr. Masseri, you want to lead us off? I recommend Mabel DeFranzer, Patrick O'Rourke, and Will Burkmeyer. Mr. O'Leary? Uh, Mabel DeFranza, Patrick O'Rourke, William Burkmeyer. Mr. Schultz? Uh, DeFranza, O'Rourke, and Burkmeyer. Mrs. Benipelli? Mabel DeFranza, Patrick O'Rourke, and Will Burkmeyer. And the chair votes DeFranza, O'Rourke, and Burkmeyer. Unanimous. Stir. Mr. Chairman, I move to place the nomination. Following names for reappointment or appointment as members of the Historical Commission for a term to expire December 31st, 2021. Chris Hayden, incumbent. Les Masterson, incumbent. Chloe McGrath. I have a motion. Do second. I have a second? Second by Mrs. Minipelli. Any discussion? Great that we have three candidates. Mr. O'Leary? Mr. Hayden, Mr. Masterson, and Ms. McGrath. Mr. Masseri? Chris Hayden, Les Masterson, and Chloe McGrath. Mr. Schultz. Hayden, Masterson, and McGrath. Ms. Manipelli. Chris Hayden, Les Masterson, and Chloe McGrath. And the chair votes Chris, Man, uh, Chris, Chris Hayden, Les Masterson, and Chloe McGrath. Library trustees. Chairman, I move to place a nomination the following names for reappointment or appointment as members of the Library Trustees for terms to expire December 31st, 2021. Two openings. Sarah Ralph, incumbent. Marianne Lay, incumbent. Kerry Antonuccio, Jennifer Thompson. Motion to have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Minipelli. Any discussion? I spoke to the two incumbents. They're very interested in continuing on. And I did not know there were a couple of others that are interested. And I think, again, yep. maybe we'll look into associate membership. Fantastic. I like the idea. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, sorry, who seconded that? Uh, Kate did. Kate did. <coughs> so uh, Sarah Ralph, Mary Ann Lape. Mr. Masseri. Sarah Ralph, Mary Ann Lape. Mr. Schultz. Uh, Miss Ralph and Miss Lape. Sarah Ralph and Marianne Lape. The chair votes Sarah Ralph and Marianne Lape. Excuse me. Mr. Chairman, I move to place a nomination the following names for reappointment or appointment to the Youth Services Committee for a term to expire December 31st, 2001. There are three openings. Patricia Harrington, incumbent. Danielle Masterson, Jason Slattery. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? None heard. This is a roll call vote. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, Patricia Harrington, Danielle Masterson, Jason Slattery. Mr. Masseri? Patricia Harrington, Daniel Masterson, and Jason Slattery. Mr. Schultz? 
Ms. Harrington, Ms. Masterson, and Mr. Slattery. Ms. Minipelli. Patricia Harrington, Danielle Masterson, and Jason Slattery. And the chair votes Patricia Harrington, Danielle Masterson, Jason Slattery. Quickly advise the board that um, uh, Judy Hall and Kathy Dardino were actually the incumbents that did not want to seek reappointment. So I think it might be a nice. I would like us, if we can, at the next town meeting, to acknowledge them for their service. They've been long-term. They were actually started the charter members. Yes, uh, charter members. We should definitely do that. A lot of recognition for them. And yes, that would be, be great. great. Take a moment and tell me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Process serving constables. Mr. Chairman, I move to place the nomination the following names for reappointment as process serving constables for terms to expire on December 31st, 2019. There are five openings John Fiorello, incumbent, Paul Dorsey, incumbent, Douglas Lamb, incumbent, David Rosati, incumbent, Paula DeRocha, incumbent. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Not heard, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Fiorello, Mr. Dorsey, Mr. Lab, Mr. Rosati, and Mrs. DeRocha. Mr. Masseri. John Fiorello, Paul Dorsey, Douglas Lab, David Rosati, and Paul DeRocha. Mr. Schultz. Mr. Fiorello, Mr. Dorsey, Mr. Lab, Mr. Rosati, and Mr. DeRocha. Mr. Mignopelli. John Fiorello, Paul Dorsey, Douglas Lab, David Rosati, and Paul DeRozier. And chair votes Mr. Ferriello, Mr. Dorsey, Mr. Lab, Mr. Rosati, and Mrs. DeRosha. Martin's Pond Committee. Mr. Chairman, I move to place the nomination the following name for reappointment as a member of the Martin's Pond Committee for a term to expire December 31st, 2021. There is one opening. George Cangiano, Jr. Come on. Second. Bye. Second. Mrs. Manufelli. And Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Cangiano. Mr. Masseri. Judge Cangiano, Jr. Mr. Schultz. Mr. Cangiano. Mrs. Manufelli. Judge Cangiano, Jr. And Chair votes Mr. Kenji Okay. And that's it, right? No, one more. Uh, that's it. Then we're going to talk about uh, the review and vote on the special employee status, Mr. Gilberto. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, through you, uh, I have been provided and have forwarded to the board a report of the Human Resources Director relative to um, the positions that were previously des designated as special municipal employees for calendar year 2018. Uh, you'll see in the listing that the recommendation is to renew that designation for the positions within the Parks and Recreation Department, the Police Department, the Council on Aging, and the Finance Committee. And there was also a request to uh, add a position, a new position, uh, which is a part-time um, position through the Youth Substance Abuse Grant known as the co-facilitator for the Youth Action Team. And I think as you saw, I may have seen in the report from Mr. Collins, uh, this is something that's been referred to us by the Youth Substance Abuse Grant Coordinator. Uh, it appears that uh, based on the advertising that we've done, the level of interest that we've seen has come mostly from public school teachers uh, who will want to take on the responsibility, which is obviously they would bring a tremendous skill set for that, but we're not able to lawfully make the appointment without the position being designated as a special municipal employee and therefore making the request for that designation. Thank you. I believe we've prepared a motion accordingly. Mr. Chairman, I move to re reaffirm the vote of December 14, 2017. <clears throat> Which was, the, what was the new one? Oh, we got a new one here, okay. Okay, reaffirm uh, the vote of December 4, 2017, designating the following positions as having special municipal employee status pursuant to Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 268A. Parks and Recreation, Infant Toddler Instruction, After School Instructor, Coach, Summer Program Instructor, Coach, Summer Program Director, Summer Program Assistant Director, 
Summer Counselor. The Police Department, Matron, Crossing Guard. Council on Aging, Van Driver. Finance Committee, Recording Secretary. I have a second? Please. There's more. Oh, sorry. Uh, nope. Don't need there's more. That's it. The That's next it. one is a separate. Oh, excuse me. Uh, and to, you're right. And to add. It's on oh. the second page. And to add the following positions as having special municipal employee status pursuant to Mass General Laws, Chapter 268A. Police Department, co facilitators, plural, for the Youth Action Team. Second. Motion is second by Mr. Schultz. Maybe. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? <coughs> Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Ratify and sign memorandum of agreement for the North Reading Administrative Staff. Mr. Bilberto. Mr. Chairman, through you, this would be a ratification for a memorandum of agreement between the town and the North Reading Administrative Staff Union. This is a union that represents uh, many of the uh, administrative staff in the town hall as well as uh, at the Council on Aging and the uh, civilian um, staff within the police and fire departments as well. Uh, this would be a three-year agreement that would cover the period beginning July 1st, 2018, running through June 30th of 2020. Um, and we intend to come back to the select board with a, a, um, a draft integrated contract for ratification um, as soon as possible, uh, much in the same fashion that we've handled um, integrated contracts in the past. And uh, I wish to thank and uh, recognize um, the Human Resources Director, Bob Collins, for um, spearheading the uh, negotiations on behalf of the town um, to uh, select board members Schultz and Manipelli for their participation in the bargaining sessions, uh, the Finance Director for her assistance, uh, and of course uh, the uh, union bargaining team um, and their uh, attorney uh, for coming to the table with us uh, and reaching this agreement uh, between the town and the union. Mr. Valeri, I'll take a motion. Ready. Mr. Chairman, I move to ratify and sign the memorandum of agreement between the town of North Reading and the North Reading administrative staff for the period of July 1st, 2018 to June 30th, 2021. Second. I have a motion to second. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Mr. Chairman, bear with me while I catch up. Thank you. Uh, I'll just note that curbside yard waste collection concluded uh, on Saturday this past weekend. It was the second collection that took place. Uh, holiday trash and recycling collection is as follows. Uh, next week it will be on Wednesday, December 26th. The following week, it'll be on Wednesday, January 2nd. Uh, we have scheduled Christmas tree collection to occur on Saturday, January 12th, and we remind the public that any items must be curbside by 6.30 a.m. The Public Works Director is intending to approach JRM, which is our trash and recycling hauler, uh, about the possibility of a one-year extension of the current trash and recycling agreement in the interest of potentially controlling cost and potentially bringing on a recycling coordinator to assist with this program for the long term. That'd be something that we would be looking at uh, as part of the fiscal year 2020 budget process for the board to ultimately make a recommendation to town meeting. If the conversation were to prove to be fruitful, we would bring the potential terms to uh, for, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me. If the conversation were to prove to be unfruitful, we would bring the potential terms for an RFP as we've discussed, as we've discussed in open forums in the past to the board for review. <coughs> I attached uh, letters from residents who are interested in town-owned land only just to put them on the board members' radar, and we do intend to schedule these for initial consideration um, at a, a meeting in January, if not on the 14th, then on the 28th. I also included for the board members an update regarding the CPC's master planning process. Some of you may be aware that they received an update from MAPC at their uh, meeting, uh, the, I believe the first meeting that they had in, uh, in December. Um, they are going to be look, I, I, looking, I believe, for um, the board to be attending a meeting of the Planning Commission to jointly uh, review their progress and kind of see what the feedback has been with the idea that the um, 
town's uh, elected leadership would all be aware of it before the plan ad advances to the next stage of planning. So we should keep uh, an eye on that and be aware that there may be a scheduling request forthcoming on that. Uh, I'm going to pass over my comments relative to the Vietnam Veterans War Memorial and the wall it heals, as well as the uh, proposed development at 20 Elm Street due to them already uh, being discussed. Finally, I included a copy of a memorandum that uh, I issued relative to the facility's master plan to implement the vote to try to create an advisory committee, and we're hopeful to get that off the ground in January. And with that, it concludes my, parent, my comments, Mr. Chairman. Great. And that brings us to old and new business. Uh, Mr. O'Leary, do you have any? Uh, other than what I stated earlier, you know, happy holidays and hopefully a healthy and prosperous new year for everybody. And Colleagues and board members, the same. Mr. Masseri. I wish to uh, wish my <coughs> members a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. And to the citizens of Not Break, Happy Holidays, Merry Christmas, and Happy New Year. Mr. Schultz. You know, happy Holidays and uh, best wishes for everybody. Mr. Kelly. Same. Happy Holidays, Happy New Year. Yeah. It's a great time of year, so uh, I hope everybody has the opportunity to share quality time with your family, recharge the batteries, enjoy your holidays. Merry Christmas to all of you. Thank you for a great year. We've uh, accomplished a lot in 2018, and I, I know we have a lot ahead of us in 2019, so I look forward to it. So I'm going to teach you as we go through that process. So, and I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.